Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Sentom, legal ordained reverend for Reserve Church. I'm a chaplain for Reserve Church, a priest for Reserve Church. I'm also a preceptor for Reserve Church. I'm a preacher for Reserve Church, you all. I have a doctor in divinity, doctor in meritism, doctor in ministry, doctor in metaphysics, all in course. I'm a professor of theology. As we've entered the month of June, and with the Ukraine war ongoing, and with numerous copycat mass shootings we've witnessed in the past few weeks, since the Buffalo New York mass shooting and the Texas mass shooting, so no matter how we work on our spiritual walks to turn into being more Christ-like and confront evil, human nature is intrinsically evil. In the last sermon and theology session, we talked about demonization, we talked about the spirit of hate as well as the spirit of anger, the types of demonic spirits that attempt to give demonic suggestions to people who carry out actions in which Lucifer does use people with hatred and hearts to unspeakable evil evils. We've also talked about the theological definition of hatred, why it is anathema to God, and why it separates people from God, and why it is so dangerous. We talked about false doctrines such as once saved, always saved, false eternal security doctrines, as well as cheap grace, and what the sin's definition is. While I look at things from a doctrinal standpoint, a lot also, and not a lot of it is entirely legalistic. However, there are specific commands we as Christians have to abide by. If we do not, we grieve the Holy Spirit and are of Christ, and the Holy Spirit isn't in us. Because, in fact, you can do things that will no longer make you of Christ. And we will be doing a refresher on the once saved, always saved, false security doctrine that many fallen Christians and nationalists, Christian nationalists preach. And as of this week, a very certain preacher that I do know was preaching on, of course, the false eternal security with everything that is happening. And considering that person in and of itself is a Trump supporter, not surprising there, so all that unrepentance, especially to idolatry. Because when it comes down to false saved, false doctrine of once saved, always saved, they believe they can do all they wish, no one has authority over them, and that no one, well, again, that they are the gods of themselves, because they do not submit to God, and therefore they cannot resist the devil. And the devil does not flee from them. So those who preach the once saved, always saved, false doctrine, I consider fallen, absolutely. So, and we'll be doing this refresher before I get into the actual sermon in general. Which, of course, you can read this stuff from the supplemental reading, which I have attached. So what is the once saved, always saved, false eternal security doctrine that fallen Christians, Christian nationalists preach? According to the article, the myth of once saved, always saved, be demonking false doctrines by Ryan A. French, once saved, always saved is a false doctrine due to few false doctrines are as dangerous as a, than a Calvinistic assertion of eternal security or once saved, always saved. This belief has become so perverse and so perversive far beyond theological academia's reach. Once saved, always saved is a popular mantra for the average low information Christian. It crosses denominational lines, bleeds between the theological spectrums, and slips into everyday dogmas. The doctrine of eternal security essentially states that nothing can cause them to be disfellowshipped from God once a person is saved. Without going too deep, it should be noted that there are numerous variances and machinations of this doctrine. In its most extreme form, a person could theoretically be saved and murder his wife while remaining unconditionally saved. Others would assert that if someone were to commit such a heinous act, he was never truly saved in the first place. Sadly, this dangerous doctrine flatly contradicts scripture, and it is commonly used as a smokescreen to justify sinful lifestyles, and aka to justify the sins beforehand of those who are so narcissistic in belittling and harming others and believing they have the right to, and that they do not have to repent for what they do. In other words, once saved, always saved, appeals to the more carnal leanings of our humanity. It gives false legitimacy for sin, false comfort to sinners, and builds a pseudo-biblical barrier between the countless sinners and repentance. Because again, they don't believe they have to repent. So this particular preacher was, of course, uh, preaching on the Romans chapter 8, which is uh, one of the key defenses of their once saved, always saved false doctrine that fallen devil doctrine. <clears throat> so we're going to bring on this a little more.
Its eerie how the Calvinistic notion of eternal security shares similarities with Satan's seduction of Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent assured Eve, you shall not surely die, Genesis 3, 4. The satanic implication being that Eve could live in disobedience without fear of divine consequences. The doctrine of eternal security makes the same false claim, and it originates from the same satanic source. Here's a primary passage of scripture used to prop up the concept of once saved, always saved. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ our Lord. And that's Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, which, of course, that particular preacher, for his particular message for this week concerning his false doctrine of once saved, always saved, he did use that, and he used certain life experiences to try to justify it, which, of course, justifying sin, especially beforehand, and all that unrepentance, again, uh, antichrist in origin. So let's continue. The doctrine of eternal security shares similarities with Satan's seduction of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. The implication being that Eve could be in disobedience without fear of divine consequences. First of all, this is a tremendously encouraging passage of the scripture, but it's talking about God's unconditional love, not unconditional salvation. With close examination, you'll find that sin is not once mentioned in the context of this promise, which, of course, that person did try to actually try to defend. But it is, again, it's not mentioned in the context of that promise. So again, when, they're, when fallen Christians are preaching false doctrines, so it's a, when it comes down to it, from a doctrinal standpoint, at least at least church doctrine, they are, again, false prophets, so fallen, absolutely. So, and they have to be marked as such, and treated as such, and held to accountability without exception. So, which is why excommunication is necessary. With close examination, you'll find that sin is not m once mentioned in the context of this promise, as with other passages used to support once saved, always saved, John 3.15, John 5.24, John 10.28, Romans 8.1, 1 Corinthians 10.13, the emphasis is always on external forces having no authority over your personal responsibilities towards God. And this is the point. Again, when these fallen Christians follow the three principles of Satanism, you can do all that you wish, so especially to others. No one has authority over you, so the church, the state, etc. You are the God of yourself because you are in control of your life. You do not submit to God. Again, because they do not accept responsibility for when they harm others, especially because they believe the ends justify the means, which of course is their own damnation. Subsequently, it's always his, his damnation. Because when it comes to being a Christian, the means justify the ends. And that is important. The means, how you do things. Which we'll be getting into much later. This is going to be a very, 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 very super lengthy sermon and theological breakdown, and I do apologize for that. But everything that is happening, again, I have a mission to do, unfortunately, or fortunately. <coughs> Let's put it this way. Nothing can force you to separate yourself from God except you. Satan can't make you do it any more than he made Eve do it. Eve exercised her free will. Adam exercised his free will. And they both suffered the consequences of their actions. Sin separates us from the right relationship with God, but it does not remove us from the love of God. For example... God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. God loved us even while we were in sin, but to say the cross made sin acceptable is to undermine the cross's necessity in the first place completely. The phrasing, while we were yet sinners, shows Paul's assumption that believers 
would naturally understand sinful lifestyles must be discarded after salvation. Furthermore, the Apostle Peter calls us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who did not sin, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. A few verses down, he underscores that Jesus bare our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto you righteousness. For ye as were sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 through 25. Nothing can force you to separate yourself from God except you. Satan can't make you do it any more than he made Eve do it. Eve exercised her free will. Adam exercised his free will. And they both suffered the consequences of their actions. God loves us even while we are in sin. But to say the cross made sin acceptable is to undermine the cross's necessity in the first place completely. But we still haven't sufficiently debunked the doctrine of eternal security. For few people would argue against the scriptural emphasis on living above sin, many would say that righteousness living is the best way but not a requirement for heaven after obedience to the gospel. So let's take a look at several scriptures that prove that it is possible to throw away our salvation and trample upon the grace of God. <clears throat> the parable of the sower gives us insight into the issue at hand. Jesus speaks of individuals who receive the gospel immediately with joy but when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, they fall away. Mark chapter 4, verse 16. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Consider these self-explanatory scriptures from the book of Hebrews. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and then have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to a new, then again, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing... They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him into open shame. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Which again, which is why the winnowing is necessary. The separating of actual Christians from those who are false or fallen. So the once saved, always saved people, they are fallen. Of course, that is until they repent and atone and change. Because again, everyone can be redeemed. This I believe wholeheartedly, which is why I'm a proponent of change, which we'll be getting back into much later during this. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 through 27. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 through 39. Additionally, Peter speaks plainly of people who return and are overcome by the pollutions of the world, stating that it would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness in the first place. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. But the words of Jesus are the most important. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And that's Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And again, those who follow the false doctrine of one saved, always saved, and preach it, their work is iniquity either way. We could go on and on demonstrating the scriptural imperative that we must not be, depart from the faith, post salvation, or risk divine judgment, which of course I will be talking about instances of this much later in my sermon. Children of God can fall from grace, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 and 13. Be led away with error, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Error from the truth, James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Weak brother may perish, 1 Corinthians 8, 11. Fall into condemnation, James chapter 5, verse 12. Be moved away from hope, Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Deny the Lord who bought them, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, which of course a good amount of Trump supporters did at the end of the day, so 
furthering that damnation, it was the depths of depravity of idolatry, and about who's that particular one. Depart from the living God, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, can be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, can become a cursed children. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. As a legally ordained reverend, I affirm that preachers, pastors, or ecclesiastical who preach the one saved, always saved, of whom use it to justify their sins, especially beforehand, so they can keep on sinning, belittling others, trying to dominate control others, aren't Christians, officially or otherwise, due to being in open rebellion against God, nor following any of Jesus' tenets and testaments. They are lost, cast away, and are fallen, and I have to affirm this according to theology and church doctrine. They deny Christ with their unrepentant beliefs and put the Lord's name in vain. Most Christians who follow once saved, always saved are Christian nationalists for the most part. Their belief that God allows their hatred and desire for dominance, control, and their idolatry to their political leaders' figureheads is an error, and they put themselves in spiritual peril for adhering to the three principles of Satanism. As a refresher for the three principles of Satanism, what is their objective? Satanists wish to develop the depraved form of devotion through a diffusion of the theory and practice of three basic principles. You can do all that you wish. No one has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. The first principle is here the full liberty to the adherent on everything he wishes to do without limits. The second is released from the principle of authority, that is, from any obligation to obey parents, the church, the state, and no places restriction in the name of the common again. The third denies all the truth that comes directly from God, paradise, deferred to poetry, judgment, tegaments, and precepts of the church, Mary, and so forth. In appearance, these principles are seductive, especially for younger people, because they do live them in the things that life is a beautiful holiday, and imagining a land of playthings, where everything is your permitted, and where your eye does not recognize any limits regarding pleasure and enjoyment. Father Abriel Gabriel Amara goes on further with this. I wish to conclude with an important observation. It is not necessary to become a Satanist in order to serve the devil and become one of his followers. There are many, alas, who do not officially consecrate themselves to Satan, but choose to follow his basic principles, and as a result, they place their souls at great risk. Christians who follow the principles of Satanism are not of Christ. We saw this clearly with the four years of Trump as well as the pandemic. Christians devaluing human life and believing they can do all that they wish, especially to others. These beliefs are not of Christ. They are antichrist in origin, since they are not of love. So those Christian nationalists who have so much hatred for others, being dominated by a spirit of hate and feeling safe in their false eternal security doctrines, again, once saved, all saved doctrine is a de devil doctrine. God did not give us a spirit of fear, hate especially. And that was a reading from the supplemental, which is attached to the, pretty much to like the end of the actual sermon. So with everything happening in the U.S. and the world, numerous copycat mass shootings, as well as the ongoing war in Ukraine, fallen Christian preachers still preaching for the false doctrine of eternal security, of once saved, always saved. This week we'll be talking about choices and Christian nationalism, why is it antichrist, and why a Christian has to stand against it. This is going to be very lengthy, but there is a specific field experience concerning what I have to talk about this week. Specifically, choices we make as humans, as Christians, and the spiritual consequences therein of not choosing love and not standing against malevolence. So to start this off, let's look at the theological definition definition of choice, choices. According to the KGB dictionary, choice is defined as choice noun, the act of choosing the voluntary act of selecting or separating from two or more things that which is preferred, or the determination of the mind in preferring one thing to another. Election. Ye know how that a good while ago God made the choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts chapter 15, verse 2. The power of choosing option. There is force, there, is, there can be no choice. Of these alternatives, we have our own choice. Care in selecting, judgment or skill in distinguishing what is to be preferred, and in giving a preference. I imagine Caesar's epithems were collected with judgment and choice. The thing chosen, 
that which is approved and selected in preference to others' selection, nor let thy conquests only be her choice. The best part of anything, that which is preferable and properly the object of choice, in the choice are sepulchres bury the dead. Genesis chapter 22, verse 6. The act of electing to office by vote, election, to make a choice of, to choose, to select, to separate, and to take a preference. Choice. Adjective. Worthy of being preferred, selection, precious, very valuable. My choicest hours of life are lost. My revenue is better than choice. Silver. Proverbs 82. Holding dear, preserving, or using with care as valuable, frugal, as to be choice of time or as advantages. Selecting with care and due attention to preference as to be choice of one's company. Link in the description, by the way. According to Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, choice is defined as, noun, an act of choosing the voluntary act of selecting or separating from two or more things that which is preferred, the termination of the mind in preferring one thing or another, selection, noun, the power or opportunity of choosing, option, three, noun, care and selecting judgment or skill in distinguishing what is preferred and giving a preference discrimination, and a sufficient number to choose among, the thing the person chosen, that which is reproved and selected in preference to others, selection. The best part, that which is preferred, superlative, worthy of being chosen or preferred, select, superior, precious, valuable, superlative, preserved for using with care as valuable, frugal, used with as to be chosen of time or of money, selected with care, and due attention to preference, deliberately chosen. Link in description, by the way. Choice and choices are very clearly defined. We have decisions to make on what to do about many things, and we have the ability to make decisions, whether for good or evil. We are given free will by God. So what does the Bible say about choices? I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For if for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is a Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, And this time next year I return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac thought they were not yet born, and had not done nothing, neither good nor bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whoever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still fault? Find fault. For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honoring bullies and another for dishonoring bullies? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured so much patient vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews, not only also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says to Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who I have not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it is said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Through the number of the sons of Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. 
for the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts has not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel, who pursued a law that would have led through righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But it, if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 23. Thank you, description, by the way. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, descendant from Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God before against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear. Down to this very day, which, of course, uh, when it comes to the once saved, always saved people and Christian nationalists, their hearts are hardened. But that's beside the point. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, Did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life for the, from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off in you, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, if you are not you who support the root, but the root that supports you, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. This is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. P word. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And again, this is the threat. Because again, when it comes to following Christ, you have to follow all of his tenets and testaments without exception. Because if you falter, and you try to justify that fallenness, that faltering, and just justify that sin and continue to sin and continue to harm people or belittle others or try to dominate control others, you're furthering yourself to damnation either way. And again, those who do not love their brothers, their others is a liar. And God actually does see this, and God has a very specific type of response to this, too. As we'll soon talk about. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature, and all wild olive tree grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back to their own olive tree? And this is the point. When it comes down to it, we, 
everyone can change and God can redeem people. So when uh, people condemn others to hell, okay, they condemn the people, but they do not condemn the actions. They deny Jesus' ability to save, and they put the Lord's name in vain, and they place themselves in spiritual peril subsequently. And many preachers do this, however. However, when it comes to my ministry, at least, my beliefs, especially the legally ordained reverend, I condemn the actions of the person, not the person himself, because, again, as we see, there is mental illness, which has to be taken care of, of course, for that person, for them to be healed, and there is types of demonic spirits. So possession, temporary possession, which we'll be getting to later, of course, concerning some real world application of the field experience I've been taken care of recently enough. And so it's the ability that people are able to change. Again, this is why Jesus died for all of us. And this way all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodlessness from Jacob, and this is, will be my covenant with them, that when I take away their sins, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his mercy judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or has been his counselor? Or who has been given gift to him, that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him, are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 36 in the Standard Version. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one of you test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with which the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap correction. But the one who sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10 in the Standard Version. We as humans are given free will to make decisions to choose to do things and to choose not to do things, whether for good or ill. When it comes to choices, we can either choose God or choose this world. Again, when it comes to choices, we can either choose God or choose this world and be corrupted from worldly devotion. The thing is, though, God uses our choices, creating and forming events and acts through people according to his will, which is in the end of it, is salvation. Again, God is love. Lucifer, of course, uses those as hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6, chapter, verse 7. God created the law of consequences, the first universal law, to counter our human sin nature, of which we inherited from Adam and Eve. So for every negative action we do, there is a consequence. 
So what does theology say about choices? According to the article, What Does the Bible Say About Choices? by John W. Brittenbaugh, choices is theologically defined as Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6. Though we were, see only a small essential portion of what God instructed Noah about life after the flood, this context is enough to know that he is providing a basis for the establishment of laws regulating social conduct. Why is this necessary? The reason given is because man is in the image of God, Man is being prepared for something far exceeding that any other part of God's creation. Man, like God, is a being who can make choices. Unlike the rest of the physical creation, man is not a creature of instinct reacting according to preset patterns, but one who must analyze and choose to do the right as stipulated by law. Animals do not react by understanding and analyzing law and then making a rational decision. Yes, they react to laws but they are reacting to one set within their brains, instinctive patterns according to which they must react. Man does not react instinctively. Because he has a mind, he is free to do the wrong thing, but he also is free to do the right thing as stipulated by the law. Link in description, by the way. According to the article, Choosing the New Man, Part 2, by Charles Whitaker, Choices is theologically defined as Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Notice another interesting similarity in terminology whenever Paul speaks of the new man. Quite consistently, he uses the verb to put on. The Greek verb is endo, which means literally to sink into. By extension, it means to enter into, to get into, or to put on. Vine's Expositionary Dictionary of the New Testament Worlds. New Testament writers often use it when referring to putting on clothes. See Matthew chapter 6, verses 25, Matthew chapter 27, verse 31, Mark chapter 1, verse 6, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, 15, 6, etc. Paul repeatedly uses the metaphor of putting on clothes when he commands us to adopt the Christian way of life. With the same predictability, he speaks of taking new, clo new clothes off to describe the abandonment of this world's lifestyle. We see it again in Colossians 3, verses 9 through 10, where he speaks of our putting off the old man with his deeds and putting on the new man. He uses the same figure of speech in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 17, the apostle goes a step further when he tells us how to dress the new man. Put on the whole armor of God. God's consistent use of the analogy of donning new clothes to describe our adoption of the new man tells us a lot about the choices we make daily. The logical conclusion of the metaphor is as inescapable as it is meaningful. The clothing we wear is largely a matter of our choice, unless an adult is in very special circumstances, as in prison or in the military, he has wide discretion in the matter of clothing. His is the choice of what to wear and when to wear it. He determines when to take clothes off and when to put them on. More than this, it is a choice he makes daily. Sometimes, many times a day, as he determines what to wear in different social contexts. So it is with the Christian walk, the way of life, and the new man. Daily, repeatedly, each day, we must choose to put on the Christian way of life. That is what Paul is telling us through his splendid clothing analogy. Christianity is a way of life. We must choose to put on that way of life and to keep it on. Just as we do with the well-worn garment, we must feel, come to feel so at home with the new man, so comfortable with his way of life, that we absolutely refuse to take it off for any reason at all. In addition, God's consistent use of the clothing analogy argues against the Protestants' false doctrine of eternal security, which I said we'd be getting to later, so here we are. Once saved, always saved, is the cry of some Protestants. Others put it in a slightly different way. It was all done at the cross. What is wrong with this? Born again Protestants, so-called Christians who claim the new man was born in them when they are accepted, Christ have in fact abdicated virtually all personal responsibility for their salvation. Take their thought to its logical conclusion. 
When we were physically born, from our viewpoint, it just happened, we had no say about it at all. It was out of our control, so the born-again Christian believes that he accepts Christ, and presto, he is saved, forever born, as a spiritual being, a new man. Thus now, in this life, he has no further responsibility. Christ did it all at the cross, and must, upon his confession of faith, irrevocably save him. This false doctrine permits its adherents to evade all responsibility to choose daily to follow Christ. True Christians know, because of the clothing analogy, that they have that ongoing responsibility to put on the new man daily. In describing the new man, the birth or conception analogy is conspicuous by its absence. However, its repeated presence, the clothing analogy, is equally conspicuous. And again, you have to fight your human nature on the daily. And the thing about the once saved, all saved, these fallen Christians, because they are absolutely fallen, because they do not take responsibility for the actions, especially when they harm others or believe they have their right to. So belittling, domineering, controlling, harming to sin, and they try to justify their sins with their Romans chapter 8, etc., etc., Again, absolutely fallen, because they are unrepentant, and they are in open rebellion against God. And those who are in rebellion against God, regardless of its hate, etc., are fallen, cast away, to be cast out, excommunicated, until they repent and atone and change, of course. Because they are, in, and they are in spiritual danger, of course, so you as a Christian cannot abandon them to that spiritual danger that they have to face physically, because we have to save people, especially from themselves, because the other person, the other human, which again is your brother and sister, they are your burden, they are your responsibility, which I will be getting to later in this, of course. But the link in the description for that, by the way. According to the article, choices Create Our Future, What the Bible Says About Free Will, by Betty Miller. Choices is defined theologically as, free will, or the freedom to make our own choices, is a very important issue in our society. Every day, each of us chooses to do the things we, that we do, unless we are in a situation where we have been stripped of our freedom, and then we must do as those who have control over us command us to do. This would be the case for those in prison, or those who are enslaved by force, or in repressive societies. Even in these circumstances, one still has freedom to make certain choices, although they may be limited. For example, one can choose as to what kind of attitude and response one would have to his or her oppressors. Those in prisons can still experience freedom when they have Christ, because true freedom is an act of the soul, and therefore each of us can make choices in our soul. Other men cannot force us to think wrongly unless we choose to agree with them. There are other circumstances that can limit our choices because of the authority that exists in the world. One of these would be the choices of school children that are limited to the authorities' decisions and rules. This is also true of the military. These are just two of many circumstances that limit one's own personal choices. However, no matter what our choices are today, they are ultimately creating our future because every choice that we make will either cause us to be blessed or cursed. Another way to put it is that things will get better or worse for us. All choices have consequences. These consequences will be for our betterment or will work to destroy us. We are also responsible for our choices. The Bible challenges us with this admonition, Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choosing life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Messages going forth in our society today have stressed our right to choose, but have not balanced it with a message that our choices also have consequences, especially in the area of lust and selfishness. For instance, most movies have glamorized many things that are bad for us and have not generally shown the destructive results of smoking, drinking, adultery, fornication, gambling, etc. Our daily choices. We face choices on a personal level daily. What shall we eat? What shall we choose to eat, healthy or just pick out on junk food? 
Whom shall we vote for? We can take the time to pray and study the candidate's position and vote accordingly, or we can refuse to vote. When we do not vote, we are actually making a choice to allow others to choose who shall rule over us. Whom shall we marry? This is a serious lifetime commitment and should never be gone without God's guidance. Making this choice foolishly or based on emotion alone has brought much heartache to many a person. And I can definitely say that from experience. This is true. What occupation should we pursue? Thus making this decision strictly based on need or money issues will regret not seeking God about this issue. God has gifted every person with a certain talent to adopt and to adapt to the jobs that are suited just for them at the right times in their lives. Should I return the money that was credited in my camp by accident, remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have to do unto you. When only God is watching, what kind of choices do we make? He is looking for people he can trust as he desires for us to use us in his work. Should I purchase this item on credit? Do I really need this item or is it something I want even though I cannot afford it? These are just some samples of the choices that we face. We also face temptations that we must resist with the word of God. The consequences of some choices are more deadly than others. When we rebel against God and choose our own way, like the Christian nationalists or those who follow the once saved, always saved, for example, we are choosing a path of destruction that will ultimately end in hell. Because of God's love and mercy to humanity, most of our choices do not have immediate results. We are given a time to repent and find the Lord and his ways. We may all get away with sinning for a while. However, in time, we will reap what we have sown. So again, in concerning the Christians who believe they can do all that they wish, especially others, be literally in dominant control and try to use the once saved, always saved false security doctrine to justify their sin and keep on sinning and harming others and not repenting. Again, they will reap what they sow. And we're getting a little bit more later in on this, of course. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that he will also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but that he soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. Wrong choices cause soul sickness. Many people are sick in their souls because they have not known the ways of the Lord and therefore have made wrong decisions. God wants us, us to heal in every area of our souls and bodies as well as give us a new life in the Spirit. To receive healing of the soul, however, we must understand it and why it needs to be healed, restored, and renewed. The Greek word, thunche, pronounced suke, is a word Bible writers use when talking about things of the natural man, which in English is called the soul. The soul of man is comprised of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Our emotional patterns tend to formulate our personalities. The soul or personality is formed through a person's reaction to the information the mind takes in, the way each person chooses to react to the things he hears, the things that happen to him, and the things he chooses to receive as truth cause each soul to become what he is or she is. However, when a person is born again, he becomes a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Galatians 6, 15, and the soul can be changed and renewed through the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we are to develop the attributes of Christ and become like him because much of our personalities are formed through our choices. We have to make new choices to let go of the old nature and receive the new. Our new natures are formed by the truths from the Word of God. The healing of the soul, which is a cleansing process, takes place as we learn to study the Word and develop a close fellowship with the Lord through prayer. The mind, will, and emotions. We might look upon human beings this way. Each of us is a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. The will is how we exercise our freedom of choice. God gave man this freedom when he created Adam. God will not violate our free wills and make us do the right thing, nor will he make the choices for us. We can choose his way, the law of spirit, or the law of Christ, Romans chapter 8, verses 22. The law of the spirit of the life in Jesus Christ 
hath made me free from the law of sin and death, or we can choose the way of self, what really is, what, which really is a devil's way, or the law of sin and death. There are only two ways, God's or the devil's. What man thinks of his own way is really Satan's way and puts him under the authority of the enemy, which we'll talk a little bit later on. If someone is not for God, he automatically is against him. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. There is no possible way man can just do his own thing and think he is not making a choice. That choice is choosing Satan's way. Even no choice on man's part is a choice because when we refuse to choose, others will make our choices for us. Satan causes men to follow him by encouraging apathy, laziness, or lack of responsibility. The mind is the intellect with reasoning being the voice of the mind. If the mind remains unrenewed, not healed, it will continue to think carnal thoughts, believe false information, false doctrines, and result in fleshly speaking and living. You can see this happen all the time. Consequently, the emotions were designed by God to express his characteristics, which are placed in our spirits when we become born again. Those are the fruits written in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23, and other places. If we do not yield to the renewal process, we continue to act like our old father, the devil. Put on the nature of Jesus. Much of the church considers sanctification or confirming the image of Jesus, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, to be optional. It is not taught or preached as much as the former generations. Many Christians born since World War II are as much as part of the me generation as the world. Self-will and rebellion are more part of society today than at any time previously in the history of the United States. It is no surprise that much of today's American church operates in carnality. This is true. Again, 70% of American Christians are not of Christ because of what they do. They fail. Gives us tenets and testaments. This repeated failure has fallen us, pure and simple. Rebellion. So the once saved, always saved crowd. Rebellion. Again, Christian nationalists, all that hatred. Also, rebellion. All of the fallen, all of an antichrist. And let's continue on this point. It is no surprise that much of today's American church operates in carnality, and it shouldn't be no surprise to us that God has finally set out to expose this evil and clean up his church. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians about crucifying the old man, this is exactly what he meant. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 through 24. When something is crucified, it is put to death. Every Christian needs the things of his old nature, which are part of his un unregurgitated soul, to be put to death in order for the life of God to permeate the whole person. We have been given the power through the Holy Spirit to overcome sin in our lives. We can choose to obey God and his will, empower us to overcome every sin. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness upon sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience and unrighteousness. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Instead of pursuing holiness, many Christians have just fought, allowed Christ to dwell in their spirits, but have not allowed him to renew their souls and heal their bodies. As soon as a person is born again, he should begin to make the choices that will put to death his old ways of thinking, talking, and acting, and allow the Holy Spirit to replace them with God's ways. So again, the preachers that preach the once saved always saved the false doctrine. Again, they are not born again. Sure, they may allow the Holy Spirit to be in them, necessarily, but they do not follow God's ways. They are in rebellion and try to justify the rebellion repeatedly and all that sin and harming others and all that unrepentantness. Again, when they try to use uh, Romans chapter 8 and all these other 
specific ones, which are articulated and highlighted, and, uh, and of course, in, I have the notes below concerning the false doctrines of once saved, always saved, in the supplemental reading. Again, fallen us. So to that particular pastor, preacher that I am necessarily calling out in the sermon, warning number one. So, continuing. Overcoming through faith. Renewing the soul will cause negative habits and emotions to change. The key to that change is faith. Through our wills, we must choose to change. However, it is only the work of the Holy Spirit who can actually bring permanent change in us. We cannot do it in ourselves. We choose to let go of the negative that allows the Holy Spirit to do the changing. But doubt and unbelief can keep a person from receiving this kind of healing as much as it does healing the body. A Christian must make the choices for God's way and against his own way in absolute faith that the Holy Spirit will do his part and make the needed change in us. If we allow our bodies to be lazy and undisciplined, they will suffer the consequences. Bad physical habits can hinder God's work in us. The Holy Spirit wants to help us overcome these ungodly ways in the soul if we choose to be resentful, hateful, angry, unkind, discouraged, worried, fearful, impatient, lusty, greedy, etc. We will allow these things to rule us instead of calling on the strength of Christ to help us overcome these negative attitudes. Many habits or addictions in the soul and body can be broken with a three-day fast. Certain desires or feelings of the body are perfectly legitimate, such as hunger, sleep, and so forth. Through the five senses, the body is the receiver of information from the world around it. The senses were given to us by God to protect us, and under the direction of the Holy Spirit, they were perfectly to serve us. However, under Satan's influence or self-will, the senses are perverted to fulfill the lust of the flesh, which can bring destruction. Chain the old habits. Every sinful habit in our lives gained its foothold through our thoughts and choices. We can gain victory over these habits by thinking God's thoughts. A person who feels unworthy and unacceptable can replace those negative feelings with the truth that through Jesus, he or she has become worthy and acceptable. The process of conforming to the image of Jesus will be successful as we choose to replace negative thoughts with positive ones. The way to change a habit of negative thinking is to choose to change that negative thought for its opposite. The Bible calls that overcoming evil with good. Romans chapter 12, verses 22 through 21. For example, if a Christian finds himself ready to repeat some negative gossip about a brother or sister, he should choose to say something nice about that person instead. Very quickly, the habit of repeating negative things about the other person will be broken. The Lord wants to save us from tragedy, sickness, fear, anxiety, and turmoil of this world. These things come upon us because our bad choices or through ignorance or chains of iniquity. Instead, God wants us to walk in the spirit of life so we may have his love, joy, peace, and victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Over every trial and temptation, our future is determined by all the choices we make today. Link in the description, by the way. Why does God allow bad, evil things to happen concerning people's choices? An exorcist explains the demonic, the answer to Satan's army of fallen angels. Father Gabriel Amorath defined free will choices and why God permits evil as, First, it is necessary to make clear that God, being infinite love, does not wish evil. He simply permits it because he created man and his angels as free creatures. Simply put, men are free to choose whether they wish to live for God or against him and therefore to offer heaven or for hell. We must recognize that God has made everything to make man happy, and in accordance with this plan, God asks man to obey the laws that he has established, but God has also given the man the ability to refuse this truth. This is the situation in which we are placed. The first who had to choose was, we had already said, were the angels who, in the case of the demons, chose to tempt men in order to attract men to themselves. The second in the dimension of the time is man, and so it falls upon each of us individually to make a choice. John's Gospel says of Christ, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 3. Could God have given to creation a greater goal than himself, than the possibility of enjoying the vision of him, the cause of eternal joy, we in fact live for him, and there could not be a more marvelous goal. Therefore, the rebellion of the angels and the susceptible disobedience of man tells us that evil is a concrete possibility and that God has permitted it in order to make us free. 
And here we are before a great mystery, the creature is freely choosing evil rather than good. That is the greatest risk that God has taken with his creatures, angels and men. And he has taken it for a simple reason, because without free will, that is, without the possibility of choosing between good and bad, we would be robots and not totally free creatures. Liberty, infinite in God, is a sign of our greatness and our sonship in Jesus Christ. Without it, we could not call ourselves sons, but only slaves. God has given us everything we must recognize only him, adore only him, and be guided by only him, because inevitably, if we do not give to God, we are necessarily give to idols. He who is not with me is against me, Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Half measures do not exist. Either we are of Christ or we are of Satan. At times, we would like to go halfway serving Christ partially. Well, that is not possible. The devious method that the devil used with Adam and Eve works also with us. It leads us to think that evil and sin do not exist. That is, sin distancing ourselves from God, trying each thing for the pleasure of having experiences is a gain. So, it, at the end, what evil is there? It is true that God permits evil, but there is also another truth that accompanies it. Without our knowing, God also puts limits on evil, limiting the action of Satan against men. We have an example of it in the book of Job. Satan obtains permission to vex Job, but God forbids him to touch Job. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself do not put forth your hand. Job chapter 1, verse 12. God always has the last word. Link in the description, by the way. Again, when it comes to choices, we are responsible for the actions and choices, whether good for good or ill, we make. God, out of love, gave us free will. Fallen Christians who follow the false eternal security doctrine, such as what's always saved, which we'll be talking about, which we talked about in the last sermon theology session, take no responsibility for their actions and believe they can do all that they wish, especially to others, and that they don't have to repent or atone, for they are eternally saved. And as Dietrich Bonhoeffer states concerning their cheap grace, Cheap grace is another word for damnation. And think about when it comes to Billy Graham's uh, preaching and sermons, he's also talked about the once saved, always saved being the false doctrine, that cheap grace. And he preaches against it too, incidentally. These fallen Christians bring themselves to separation from God, bring themselves to their own damnation, which is Lucifer's aim, since he cannot win a conventional war against God, he will take as many souls as he can with him. This is why we have to repent daily, change our ways, and live a life of repentance, forgiveness, forgive others of their trespass and transgressions, just as God forgives you. And following Jesus' tents and testaments, we have to put on the new man, our new clothes daily, and die to our fallen human nature on the daily. We have to take responsibility for our actions to repent, which means to change. From that which we learned, John, repentance is changed in the last sermon theological session, this is the thing about fallenness. People returning their own sins after the taste of salvation, the dog returning its own vomit, and the sire returning the wallowing in the mire after being cleaned and made new. Without spiritual discipline and the desire for the change, people return to their own set ways and become lost, fallen, cast away in the process. Those who follow the false doctrine once saved, always saved, are the sow returning their wallowing in the mire. They were Christians upon salvation, but once they were saved, they believed they could do all that they wish and still be Christians which, of course, there are things that can no longer make you of Christ. Christian nationalists fall to this as well, especially thanks to their hatreds, and believe God allows them to do as they wish to those they hate and those they try to dominate, and the reason why they and their ideology is pure antichrist. So before we get further into this, let's take a further look at the fall of man, the origin of sin, from a theological perspective. The origin of sin, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in Creation and Fall Temptation, two biblical studies from the chapter to the religious question. Sin's origin is, Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature than the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of, which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Just as Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The command to not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the creation of Eve, and the serpent must be understood as a connected series in the assault upon the tree of life. They all come from God the Creator, and yet, strange to say, they form a common front with man against the Creator. Their prohibition 
which Adam heard as grace becomes law, causing anger in man and in God. Woman, who was created as a companion for man to help him bear his limit, becomes a seducer. The serpent, one creature of God among others, itself becomes an instrument of evil. How does this happen? The Bible does not give the answer at any rate, not a direct or an unequivocal one. Characteristically, it answers indirectly. We would be simplifying and completely distorting the biblical narrative if we were simply involve the devil who, as God's enemy, caused all this. This is just what the Bible does not say, for the very definite reasons. Similarly, we would be misinterpret the context completely if we lay the blame on man's freedom for good and evil and not on his wrong use of this freedom. It is a characteristic and essential thing about the biblical narrative that the whole event takes place in the world created by God and that no diaboli ex machina are set in motion to make this inconceivable event understandable and to dramatize it. The double light in which the creation and evil appear here cannot be resolved in any way without destroying the central point. The ambiguity of the serpent of Eve and on the tree of knowledge as creatures of the grace of God and as a place of the voice of evil must be maintained as such as much, but not crudely torn asunder in the ambiguity or ambiguous interpretation. The twilight, the double light in which the creation appears here is the only possible form in which man in the middle can speak of this event and the Yahweh too was man in the middle. Only in this way can we, as we must, both put the guilty, guilt completely onto man and at the same time stress that the guilt is conceivable, inexplicable, and inexhaustible. It is not the purpose of the Bible to give information about the origin of evil, but to witness to its character as guilt and as the infinite burden of man. To ask about the origin of evil, independently of this, is far from the mind of the biblical writer. And for this very reason, the answer cannot be unequivocal and direct. It will always contain two aspects, that as a creature of God, I have committed a completely anti-godly and evil act, and that for that very reason, I am guilty, moreover, and excusably guilty, it will never be possible simply to blame the creation for being imperfect and make it responsible for my evil. The guilt rests upon me alone. I have committed evil in the midst of the primeval state of creation. The full inconceivability of this act is expressed here in Genesis 3 by the fact that it is not an evil forced from somewhere or other that suddenly breaks forth into creation. Now this evil is completely hidden within the world of creation and occurs in the creation through man. If there had previously been an account of the fall of Lucifer as Catholic dogmatics and as Luther too would have had it, Adam would be Lucifer as first victim and such he would be in principle be relieved of his burden. But the unadorned biblical account says that in fact that the fall was prepared and took place in the midst of the creation and that is just by this means that it is completely and inexcusability is expressed in the plainest possible way. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. It is not simply said that the serpent is the devil, the serpent is a creature of God, but it is more subtle than all the others. In the entire story, the devil incarnate is never introduced, and yet evil does take place through man, through the serpent, and through the tree. In its first place, it is only the word of God itself, which is used once more. The serpent asks, Did God say? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. The serpent does not dispute this word, but it enables man to catch sight of the hitherto unknown profundity in which he would be in the position to establish or dispute whether a word is the word of God or not. The serpent itself, in the first place, only suggests the possibility that man has perhaps misunderstood here, since God could not possibly have meant it in this way. God, the good creator, would not impose such a thing upon his creature. This would be a limitation of his love. The decisive point is that this question is us to man that he should go behind the word of God and establish what it is by himself out of his own understanding of the being of God. Should it contradict this understanding, then man has clearly made a mistake. Surely it can only serve God's cause if such a false words of God. Such misunderstanding commands are swept aside before it is too late. This misleading thing about this question is therefore that it obviously wants to be thought to come from God. For the sake of the true God, it seems to want to sweep aside the given word of God. Beyond this given word of God, the serpent pretends somehow to know something about the profundity of the true God who is badly misrepresented in this human word. The serpent claims to know more about God than man, who depends on God's word alone. 
the serpent knows of the greater, nobler God who does not need such a prohibition. In some way, it wants to be itself the dark root from which the visible tree of God then springs up. And from this position of power, the serpent fights against the word of God. It knows that it only has power where it claims to come from God to be pleading his cause. It is evil only as a religious serpent. The serpent, which derives its existence only from the power of God in this question, is asking and which can be evil only where it is religious, now claims to be the power that is behind the word of God, from which God himself is the first place, draws his power. <clears throat> the serpent's question was a thoroughly religious one, but with the first religious question in the world, evil has come upon the scene. Where evil appears in its godlessness, is it powerlessness, it is a boogie, we do not need to hear it, fear it. In this form, it does not concentrate its power, but diverts us from the other place, where it really desires to break through, and here it is wrapped in the garment of religiousness, the wolf in sheep's clothing, Satan in an angel's form and light. This is the shape appropriate to evil. Did God say? That plainly is a godless question. Did God say that he is love, that he wishes to forgive our sins, that we need only believe in him, that we... That we need... His works. That we need no works. That Christ has died and been raised for us. That we shall have eternal life in his kingdom. That we are no longer alone, but hopeful by God's grace. That one day all sorrow and all wailing shall have an end. Did God say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness? Did he really say it to me? Perhaps it does not apply in my particular place. Did God say that he is a God who is wrathful towards those who do not keep his commandments. Did he demand the sacrifice of Christ? I know better that he is the infinite good, the all-loving Father. This is the question that appears innocuous. But through it, evil wins power in us. Through it, we become disobedient to God. If we met this question in its real godlessness, we should be able to resist it, but that in no way to attack Christians. They must be approached with God himself. They must be shown a better, prouder God than they seem to have, if they are to fall. What is the real evil in this question? It is not that it is asked at all. It is that the false answer it contained within it. That which within it is attacked, the basic attitude of the creature towards the creator. Man is expected to be judge of God's word instead of simply hearing and doing it. This is accomplished as follows. On the basis of an idea, a principle, some previously gained knowledge about God, man is now to judge God's concrete word. When man proceeds against the concrete word of God with a weapon of a principle, with the idea of God, he is in the right from the first. He becomes God's master. He has left the path of obedience. He has withdrawn from God's addressing him. In other words, this question is a possibility. is played off against the reality, and the possibility undermines the reality. However, in man's relationship to God, there is no possibilities, there is only reality, there is no allow me, there is only command and obedience. For the first man who lives entirely within this reality, this appeal to what is possible for him, i.e. not to obey the word of God, is equivalent to being addressed in his freedom in which he entirely belongs to God. It is only made possible when this possibility of disobedience towards God is wrapped up in the reality of him being for God, only because the question is asked in a way that Adam can understand it as a new possibility of being for God, can it lead him to being against God? The possibility of our own will to be for God, discovered by ourselves, is a real evil in the serpent's question. Let us be on guard against such cunning exaggeration of God's command. The evil one is certainly in them. The serpent's question merely proved to be the satanic question par excellence. The question that robs God of his honor aims to divert man from the word of God, while appearing to be religious in this question, attacks God as the ultimate presumption of all existence. Link in the description, by the way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer goes further in Sictus Deus, chapter of Creation and Fall Temptation, two biblical studies. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat, a, eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil, Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. Inasmuch as Eve has involved herself 
in this conversation, the serpent can narrow the real attack. It speaks about God, and indeed, with an attitude of deep knowledge and the secrets of God, i.e., it speaks religiously. But this religiousness is now unmasked in an open attack. Did God say? Link in description, by the way. That was the fall of man. Did God say? Which the serpent, a wolf in sheep's clothing, asked Eve in the first temptation. Again, when it comes to the false doctrines and antichrist ideologies, a true question was never spoken concerning their own beliefs. This is how Lucifer diverts Christians to his cause, of whom fall in the process. We witness this extensively with Christian nationalists. They are antichrist in their beliefs, ideology, in questioning God's word, and placing their own desires for dominance, control, death, and destruction of those they hate. Again, did God say? When the bad maliciousness and malevolence is mixed with the good, that is corruption of the soul, sickness of the spirit, which removes the Holy Spirit from them. So let us get back to the second topic point in the sermon. As for the past some months or so, with increasing bans laws instigated by Christian nationalists, whose beliefs actually go against doctrine for their own control of dominance of others and the firm belief they can do all that they wish, especially to others they hate, which of course is pure antichrist, knowing his authority over them that they are the gods of their own lives, they are in control and they subsequently don't submit to God, the definite, definitive three principles of Satanism. So let's have a refresher on Christian nationalism. According to the article on Christianity Today entitled, What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is defined as You've probably seen headlines recently about the evils of Christian nationalism, especially since the Simon's Jericho March in Washington, D.C., and since a mob of Trump supporters, many sporting Christian slogans, symbols, etc., rioted and stormed the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th. What is Christian nationalism, and how is it different from Christianity? What is nationalism? There are many definitions of nationalism in active debate about how to best define it. I reviewed the standard academic literature on nationalism and found several recurring themes. Most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually distinct internal and cultural groups defined by shared traits like language, religion, ethnicity, or culture. From there, scholars say nationalists believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that governments should promote and protect a nation's cultural identity, and that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for human beings. What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, not merely as an observation about Christian American history, American history for that matter, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Scholars like Samuel Huntington have made a similar argument that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past and that we will lose our identity and freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance. Christian nationalists do not reject the First Amendment and do not advocate for theocracy, but they do believe that Christianity should enjoy a privileged position in the public sphere. The term Christian nationalism is relatively new, and its advocates generally do not use it on themselves, but it accurately describes American nationalists who believe American identity is inscrutable from Christianity. What is the problem with nationalism? Humanity is not easily divisible into mutually distinct cultural groups. Cultures overlap, their borders are fuzzy. Since cultural unions are fuzzy, they make poor fit as to the foundation of political order. Cultural identity are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around, but political boundaries are hard and semi-permanent. Attempting to found political legitimacy on cultural like this means political order will constantly be in danger of being felt as illegitimate by some groups or another. Cultural pluralism is essentially inevitable in every nation. Is that really a problem or just an abstract worry? It is a serious problem. When nationalists go about constructing our nation, they have to define who is and who is not part of the nation, but there are always dissenters and minorities who do not or cannot confirm the nationalist's preferred cultural template. In the absence of moral authority, nationalists can only establish themselves by force. Scholars are almost unanimous that national governments tend to become authoritarian and oppressive in practice. For example, in past generations, the extent that the United States had a quasi-established official religion of Protestantism, it did not respect true religious freedom. Worse, the United States and many individual states used Christianity as a proxy to support slavery and segregation. What do Christian nationalists want that is different from normal Christian engagement in politics? Christian nationalists want to define America as a Christian nation and they want the government to promote a specific cultural template as the official culture of the country. Some have advocated for an amendment to the Constitution to recognize America's Christian heritage, others to reinstate prayer in public schools. Some work to enshrine a Christian nationalist interpretation of American history and school curricula, including that America has a special relationship with God or has been chosen by him to carry out a special mission on earth. 
others advocate for immigration restrictions, specifically a brand new change in American religious tax, ethnic demographics, or a change in American culture. Of course, we saw this Trumpism with his racist policies, which, of course, President Biden is doing no one's any favors for continuing to follow Trump's racist policies. And this is why I'm morally opposed to Biden, because of our immigration. And I was uh, morally opposed to Trump because of the racism and immigration and so much more. I mean, again, watching all these people sell their souls for one person, that idolatry. Yeah, scary, but if you actually understand spiritual enthrallment, and if you actually do keep up concerning the book of Revelation and everything that's supposed to happen, not surprising. But all that maliciousness and malevolence is not of Christ. It is pure antichrist. I do from this as a legally ordained reverend. But those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we have to work towards their salvation either way. Some, again, like the scholars have in Huntington, have argued that the United States government must be tended to enshrine its predominant Anglo-Protestant culture to ensure the survival of American democracy, and sometimes Christian nationalism is more evident not in its political agenda, but in the sort of attitude in which it is held, an unstated presumption that Christians are entitled to primacy in place of public square caused because they are heir to the true essential heritage of the American culture, that Christians have a presumptive right to define the meaning of the American experiment because they view themselves as free America's architects, first citizens, and guardians. How is this dangerous for America? Christian nationalism tends to treat other Americans as second-class citizens. If it were fully implemented, it would not respect the full religious liberty of all Americans. Empowering the state through moral legislation to regulate conduct always carries the risk of overreaching, a setting of bad precedent, and creating governing powers that could be used later and be used against Christians. Additionally, Christian nationalism is an ideology held overwhelmingly by white Americans and thus tends to exasperate racial and ethnic cleavages. In recent years, the movement has grown increasingly characterized by fear and by belief that Christians are victims of persecution. They really are not here in America, but again, God allows the law of consequences to be enacted on those who harm others, especially if they claim to be his children. And this is the truth, because God has to discipline them. So again, your choices matter. Your actions and your words do how you treat others, especially do, which will be getting back later to us because there's the spiritual warning that I have to do. <clears throat> Some are beginning to argue that American Christians need to prepare to fight physically to preserve America's identity and arguing that played in the January 6th riot. And of course, uh, they believe that they need to prepare to fight again goes against Jesus' tense and testament. So again, following this, pure and simple. Because again, hath God said, did God say? Again, this is how Lucifer corrupts people and takes their souls. And again, and the false doctrine people of false doctrine once saved, always saved believe they can do all they wish, they do not have to repent. And this, and Lucifer uses them subsequently. <clears throat> How is Christian nationalism dangerous to the church? Christian nationalism takes the name of Christ for a worldly political agenda, proclaiming that its program is a political program for every true believer. That is wrong in principle, no matter what the agenda is, because only the church is authorized to proclaim the name of Jesus and carry his standard into the world. It is even worse with a political movement that champions some causes that are unjust, which is the case with Christian nationalism and its adherent liberalism. In this case, Christian nationalism is calling evil good and good evil. It has taken the name of Christ as a fig leaf to cover its political program, treating the message of Jesus as a tool of political propaganda and the church as a handmaid and cheerleader of the state. Link in the description, by the way. Christian nationalism is not just heretical, as stated in the Bible and theology. We Christians are one church across the world. 
we are of Christ and have unity in Christ. Those who are Christian athletes do tend to divide that which they are spiritually not to do, doing Lucifer's work for him. They are marked as such spiritually, and we see the results of it. But also the false doctrine and false belief. We do see that the spirit of anger is so prevalent in Christians, those that gave away to Christianism, Trumpism these days, making them no longer feast, love, and they don't follow the majesty day in God's image. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21, let alone any Christ tense the testaments. We see the failure of them exemplifying the fruits of the spirits as well, with hatred and anger, both being driving force for them, which again, in Galatians chapter 5, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, amnity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rather dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, origins, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, 21. The reality of this transformation of these Christians into fallenness is that they do not and will not inherit the kingdom of God due to the hatred and anger both being separation from God. Lucifer's aim is to take as many souls with him as possible. So those taxes of separation from God are very evident. So before I go deeper in this theological dive, considering the time frame right now is an hour and 26 minutes, scary there, I know. Especially with everything that is happening here in the U.S., all the mass shootings, bans, fictive laws concerning the world of devotion, and that so many Christians who fell, fell into and following QAnon are believing Trump to be the divine savior, enacting bans, laws of dominance, and purposely harming others, and going against Christ's tenets and testaments for power, dominance, and control concerning their Christian national beliefs. Let's take a look at diabolical obsession. According to Father Gabriel Amaroff, diabolical obsession is defined as diabolical obsessions are disturbances or extremely strong hallucinations that the demon imposes often invisibly on the mind of the victim. In these cases, a person is no longer master of his own thoughts. Rather, he is subjected to a powerful force that creates mental activity that is repetitive, obsessive, and irresistible. Such representations of reality, even if foreign in its manner of thinking, become profoundly fixed on psyche. The objects of these hallucinations can be manifest in visions as voices rustling, or they can appear as monstrous figures, horrifying animals, or devils. In other cases, it can be the impulse to commit suicide or do evil to others. The history of cases is so fast it is impossible to enumerate all the forms of diabolical obsession. Link in the description, by the way. He goes a bit further in discussing spiritual changes in people when they get involved in things, other practices, beliefs, which we see in QAnonism and QAnon and Trumpism, nationalism and Christianism. It's curious that in secularized and scientific era like ours, where everything is credi anything credibly must be experimentally demonstrated, so many people dive in these types of experiences that deal so strongly with the invisible world, the response is quite simple. When faith in God declines, idolatry and irrationality increase, man must then look elsewhere for answers to his meaningful questions. That is exactly what we've gotten with with QAnon, Trumpism, Christian nationalism, all that idolatry and belief Trump has the answers for them, it is diabolical obsession by the exorcist church doctrine definition alone. So as a refresher concerning idolatry, which Christian nationalism does not or does do concerning their heroes such as Trump. Idolatry, now, image worship or divine honor paid to any created object. Paul describes the origin of idolatry in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Men first with God and seeking ignorance and moral corruption. The forms of idolatry are fetishism or worship of trees, rivers, hills, stones, natural worship, worship of the sun, moon, stars, as is opposed powers of nature, hero worship, the worship of deceased ancestors and or heroes. According to God Questions articles, what is the definition of idolatry? Idolatry is defined as... The definition of idolatry, according to Webster, is the worship of idols, excessive devotion to, or reverence for some person or thing. An idol is anything that replaces the one true God. And a reminder, when it comes to idolatry, excessive devotion to, or reverence for something, one person or something, an idol is anything that replaces the one true God. So that hero worship of Trump, devotion to something other than God himself and God alone, and whatever QAnon leaders, political leaders, they follow without hesitation, committing heresy, blasphemy, idolatry, and worldly devotion, all of it is Antichrist and that is excluding their hatred for others and desire to dominate, control, and harm those they hate. Which is why diabolical obsession comes to mind concerning idolatry and worldly devotion. Again, hatred is separation from God and hatred is damnation. In their purposeful choice, they sell their souls rather cheaply 
their devotion to someone or something other than God. As Jesus said in the book of Matthew, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money, you cannot serve God or anything else for that matter. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Dietrich Bonhoeffer comments on what Jesus said in this quote concerning worldly devotion and idolatry. As Jesus says, there is no alternative. Either we love God or we hate him. We are confronted by an either or. Either we love God or we love earthly goods. If we love God, we hate the world. And if we love the world, we hate God. It makes no difference whether that love be conscious and deliberate or not. In fact, it is morally certain that it will be neither and that our conscious and deliberate desire will be to serve two masters, to love God and good things in life. We shall go indignantly repeat it to suggest that we hate God and will be firmly convinced that we love him whereas trying to combine love for him with love of the world we are turning our love for him into hatred and then we have lost the single eye and our hearts no longer in fellowship with Jesus our deliberate intentions make no difference in the results you cannot serve two masters if ye be followers of Christ but it comes to me personally no human political cause or anything is worthy of devotion only God we see the consequences of it, Nazism and genocide in World War II. We see it with authoritarian regimes, communists and fascists alike. And we are still witnessing it in the ongoing war in Ukraine with patriarch hero and the Russian Orthodox Church's adherence to the blood and soil ideology, which is Christian nationalism in which they bless Putin's war and are complicit with the evil and the atrocities we are still witnessing. According to the article, white Christian nationalism is a fundamental threat to democracy, fills us Gorski and Samuel L. Perry discuss their new book, The Flag and the Cross, by Sarah Jones, Christian Nationalism as a Threat, because an ideology is on the march, traces of it is a detectable in a racist massacre in Buffalo, in Tucker Carlson's monologues and Marjorie Taylor Greene's public comments, find it again in the right's anti-abortion rhetoric with poorly disguised demographic anxiety or in the right's response to the school shooting in Levade, Texas, which shows an embracing God and guns with even greater conviction. This ideology has a name, argues sociologist L Samuel Perry of the University of Oklahoma and Philip S. Gorsi of Yale University. Perry and Gorsi call it white Christian nationalism, and in their view, it represents a pressing threat to democracy. In the Flag and Cross, in their new book from Oxford University Press, white Christian nationalists undergo careful scrutiny. Combining research with data analysis, Gorsi and Perry argue that white Christian nationalists share a set of common anti-democratic beliefs and principles. These are beliefs that, we argue, reflect the desire to restore and privilege the myths, values, identity, and authority of a particular ethno-cultural tribe, they write. These beliefs add up to a political vision that privileges the tribe, and they seek to put other tribes in their proper place. I recently spoke with Gorsi and Perry about their findings of the threat of white Christian nationalism poses to democracy. Why do you think the term white Christian nationalism is so important to use? Gorsi, I think because it identifies one of the deepest and most powerful currents in American political culture. One that has been invisible to most folks outside of that culture and even, in a way, to a lot of people inside of that culture because it's the water they swim in and the air they breathe. And, of course, it's also important because it is right now evolving into a deeply anti-democratic ideology, one that really is driving some of the most radical fringe groups in the United States today, including many mainstream political candidates in the Republican Party. I, Perry, I would say that one element we see just from an empirical standpoint is that quantitative and indicator of Christian nationalist ideology seems to operate differently for white Americans than for, say, African Americans. When a white Americans take our surveys and answer questions about whether the United States is a Christian nation or we don't need a separation of church and state or we should advocate Christian values in the government, for them it is powerfully associated with things like nostalgia and authoritarianism in certain vision of America's history as this kind of mythic story that we have a special relationship with God and that there is a kind of place that we are going this deep story and the vision we talk about in the book say for African Americans the African Americans who take the survey and answer the same questions those questions mean something different. Clearly, for African Americans to affirm those kinds of statements about Christian nation, Christian values, Christian heritage, they don't think nostalgically for a better time. They think aspirationally. It seems, from the way they respond to other questions, that they respond to a lot of what Phil has talked about in a previous book on civil religion, that there is this aspirational component of American civil religion that holds to a creedal understanding of what America is supposed to be about, our constitution principles. 
And you can see what would seem like Christian nationalism in the mouth of Martin Luther King Jr. or Fr Frederick Douglass, properly understood as calls to live up to the values we claim to adhere to. In my own writing, and it's not just me, I've used the term Christian right. But it sounds like you're talking about something specific. More specific. Perry. I think Christian right is shorthand for people who hold the ideology that we're talking about. Since Trump came into office, the narrative was constantly about white evangelicals, white evangelicals, white evangelicals, and why they stick with Trump. What we've tried to do is to steer away from that white evangelical conversation and talk about the underlying ideology called white Christian nationalism that drives that support for Trumpism, his brand of politics, and all these other authoritarian and anti-democratic things. The Christian right, I think, is a similar kind of shorthand for a group of people that adheres to this ideology we talk about. Morsky. The other reason I think we really use that term, white national Christianism, is that it connects policy preferences that we associate with the Christian right to an underlying narrative that connects their positions. I think a lot of those folks go, well, gosh, how can you be anti-abortion and pro-gun? And how can you claim to be pro-life but also be pro-death penalty? What does supporting the pol police or opposing masks and vaccines have to do with being a Christian? It doesn't really make sense if you just look at it from a perspective of Christian ethics. But it does make sense if you look, think about it in terms of this underlying narrative or story about the white Christian nationalism. In particular, I think it's important to understand this thing that we call the Holy Trinity of white Christian nationalism in the book Freedom, Order, and Violence, which means a kind of libertarian freedom for people like us, us being above all straight, white, native, more and more Christian men, order for everybody else, which means racial and gender order above all else, and that kind of righteous violence is directed against anybody who violates that order. You write in the book that the Christian nationalists often have a completely incorrect understanding of American history. Can you talk about the most tend to be attracted to them and, and why? Gorski, well, because it puts people like them in the center of the American story and it puts the American story at the center of the cosmic drama. Why Christians like us are the real Americans and that America is an exceptional nation, the chosen nation that is playing a specific role in the battle between good and evil the end times, etc. So it doesn't want to be that center of cosmic drama. That's why we get drawn to the thriller novels of the Harry Potter books, right? Because it's the same sense, you know, that there is the secret stuff that's actually going on, and there are a few people who know, and they are going to defend freedom or the good fight against evil, so of course the story is attractive. And I guess the one other thing I would add to this is that if you think in terms of this narrative, if you're a white Christian, it doesn't matter when you showed up in the United States, you have a kind of a birthright you belong. Perry, I would say the flip side component of Phil's analysis there, which is spot on, that there is a huge identity-based motivation to believe that these myths about America's past that are factually incorrect, oftentimes. Another part of this is that, frankly, a lot of people in these communities are socialized into believing it is because there's an entire Christian nationalism in Structural complex that is built to continue to perpetuate this myth. I'm looking on my shelves over here, and I'm in fact got five different Bibles that carry various names, like the Founder's Bible, the Patriot's Bible, actually several Patriot Bibles. There's one for teenagers and one for women, and there's all these books and all the video series and programs that are pulled, put out by wall builders that focus on the family or various institutions. The goal of these media resources is to either provide religious leaders with the kind of ammunition or to provide religious consumers, people in the pews with information about America's Christian past that may or may not be factually correct. But it is designed, as Phil says that we're talking about, to center white Christian Americans within the story and to tell them that this nation is founded on Christian values for Christian people. This is a narrative that this nation can only work if Christianity is a foundation or biblical principles for Christian values, and of course, they get to decide what that means. Again, decisions, choices. So there's both an identity-based kind of driven there, as well as a real source of information that continues to be put front and center in congregations week in, week out. You write that white Christian nationalism is entangled with the holy trinity of racial order, Christian freedom, and male violence. Other than Trump, who are the contemporary political figures you see fitting into this tradition? Perry, I think about anyone who subscribes to Trumpism and ultimately the political figures who advocate for it. You see this in Marjorie Taylor Greene. You see this in Wendy Rogers, Josh, Mid Josh Middell. I think J.D. Vance more and more. Elise uh, Stefanik, 
anything that appeals to white Christian ethnoculture, not Christianity. I mean, sometimes you get a couch into vague language about returning to God, but it's also combined with a worship of gun culture, a worship of capitalism as opposed to what left us or a socialist agenda. If they discuss race at all, it's very much in a colorblind way. Let's stop talking about race and let's talk about the kind of move on to remember how awesome America is. I think any politicians who are spouting that kind of rhetoric or tipping their hand is either the kind of ideology they themselves espouse or it's kind of ideology they believe people want to feel as though they are hitting those notes on Twitter or social media or in their speeches. Obviously, we find in our surveys that this is what we represent among the American population. It's not the majority, but it's not an insignificant minority of Americans, Christians who hold these kind of views. So I think those would be exemplifiers of this kind of things we represent. I think in the earlier years, it would have been Mike Huckabee and who he represents and the kinds of things he is saying. Michelle, Michelle Bachman before that. In terms of people who are out there, I think, sharing those kinds of things, you've got Charlie Kirk, to that racist xenophobe, and Eric Metaxas, which I'll be getting to later in this, of course. Not political leaders, but religious leaders who are spouting the same kind of ideology, that antichrist ideology, I might add. Gorsi, I think right now, their preferred packaging for the Holy Trinity is replacement theory. It's very clear who is being replaced, and it's very certainly implied and often stated what needs to be done. It is interesting that the preferred means are always the kind of closer, potentially violent ones. Nobody says, well, we should really have more stringent requirements for E-Verify to make sure that people are actually citizens or have green cards in order to be employed. Now it's like, let's send more ice guys to the border. Let's build the wall. The preferred means of enforcing the order are always coercive and potentially violent ones. The loudest versions of this do come from the entertainment wing of the Republican Party, so Steve Bannon, so that racist xenophobe, and of course, pretty much fascist Nazi uh, ideology. Again, person that is so dominated by the spirit of anger and hatred. So spiritually enthralled, knowing you know that life's a Lucifer by default, so they cannot be allowed. You know, it's their personal choice. So that's understanding enthrallment, spiritual enthrallment. So, Z. Bannon, Charlie Kirk, and Eric Metaxas, and Laura Ingram, and Tucker Carlson, of course, who are the loudest and most explicit about this, and then folks within the Republican Party try to couch this more in terms of voting rights and election fraud and illegal immigration, but of course those things are connected. You write a lot about male violence. I think you use the term righteous violence in another section of the book. And you spoke earlier about this worship of gun culture that exists. Are you able to extrapolate from that and talk about how important this worship of gun culture is to giving up on persuasion? Is this related to the right's anti-democratic tendencies? Perry, it's difficult to assess what causes what. But I can tell you that there would be a strong correlation between, say, the veneration of gun rights above all rights and belief that, say, voting is a privilege, not a right. Something that be minimized or marginalized or just taken away entirely, or that access to a vote political power should be limited. I actually haven't looked into this, but I'm 100% certain that those two things are strongly correlated. It's a matter of how do we explain those links. And I think the link of this kind of appeal, as Phil was talking about, there's this partial part of that holy trend, the idea that the freedom for us amounts to freedom to control who has access to violence. And we have control problem populations. We ensure order through the access to violence. That could be physical violence, but also the authoritarian removal of access and opportunities from those who are able to participate in democracy. That's exactly why we see that same people who would say, we need to stop rampant voter fraud. We need to make sure voting is not made easier, but more difficult and more challenging. Would be the same people who say, we secure all our rights with gun rights. That's why gun rights are the most important, because it secures every other right through the access of violence. If I got any pushback from the article at the time, it was people who said, well, gun rights, of course, are the most important because you can't have any other rights unless you have access to guns. In other words, violence. Unless we are able to control deviants and problem populations, people who want to take away our rights with gun violence, then nothing else really matters, even religious rights, which is really a fascinating contradiction. 
You end the book with what I would call a warning about the threat of white Christian nationalism as to democracy. Could you speak a little bit more of why it's so threatening and what, if anything, can be done with it? Gorski. The way I'll explain it is best, you'd often hear that Christian, white Christian nationalists talk about taking back society or democracy for we the people, citing, of course, the opening line of the Constitution. But when we say we the people, they mean us the people, and they're saying soto voco. Okay, not you, who are not real Americans. And this sounds democratic in a sense, but it's about the people being in charge. And it's actually anti-democratic because it excludes many American citizens from full citizenship and because it justifies various means of limiting the vote. So I find very strong correlation between white Christian nationalism and support for gerrymandering, support for election college, or support for various other kinds of means of restricting the vote. I think it is no longer in the run, something you're hearing increasingly that we need to create a society that's based on biblical principles, and that they, of course, mean by this, not by the beatitudes. You know what they mean by this in Leviticus. Strict laws that reinforce our place in the society. I think the reason this is so frightening is that we know how the script works, right? It's already been running for a good decade in Hungary, for example, and it's been running that long in India. It's not something specific to the Christian world, and it ends in autocracy. So this is a fundamental threat to democracy, understood as a liberal democracy, a democracy where there is a rule of law, a democracy where there are rights for all. Perry, just speaking really quickly as to what can be done about it, I think we are faced with a problem that transcends traditional parts and lines, a lot of cultural ones. It requires a coalition of people who recognize this as a threat. If we are able to all convince that one year from now an asteroid was going to strike the Earth, we would hope put aside petty differences in order to try to work together to solve this common problem, and we as a nation in the world facing common asteroids are that coming to kill us. One of those was COVID. One would hope we would unite together to cooperate and solve the problem of this pandemic. Another one that we are facing is climate change, and why Christian nationalism represents American manifestation of a global trend toward authoritarian populist regimes and anybody who values democracy and legal equality and representation in liberal democracy in that regard is facing a problem. And so in the United States, we need to recognize that we need to cooperate with people who think differently from us on a variety of issues, but we are united in our opposition to that movement. We want to preserve a constitutional democracy where we are able, through free and fair elections, to replace leaders who are bad and regimes that are bad with representative governments. And so I think the movement that we are seeing in white American nationalism, Christian nationalism, looks to dismantle that because it has to. I'm not sure how you want to position this, but I think statistically it's inevitable that secularization is slowly creeping throughout the United States. That spiritual trauma and so many other terrible things, which I'll be getting to shortly. That happens through democracy and career replacement. This also happens just as Americans are chaining their activities to a variety of regards, and Americans are moving leftward on the social issues and on the more moral issues, and there are many surveys that can document that trend. Why Christian nationalism represents a shrinking minority of the population, and yet they still look to have political and cultural influence. The only way they are going to be able to do that over the long term is to change the political situation to where they can rule from a minority position forever. That ought to be a threatening to people who understood why it's a problem. Link in the description, by the way. No, that was pretty lengthy, but that's very important too, by the way. So Christian nationalism is antichrist to sociology, heresy, certainly fasting, idolatry, and much worse. It goes against the majesty in God's image. First John chapter four, verse seven through twenty-one, concerning the depths of depravity we've witnessed from the modern era into the current year with Christian nationalism, especially Russia's version of blood and soil ideology, like similar to the Nazis which we are witnessing continue to unfold in the war in Ukraine, having strong rise and leading to mass shootings like the one in Buffalo, New York. Again, all Antichrists have to affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. At the end of the day, Christian nationalists, for the most part, the spirit of anger, the spirit of hate, dominate them and control them, giving temptations and demonic suggestions to dominate others, harm others, and much worse. For again, Lucifer uses those with hate in their hearts to do unspeakable evils, and this is irrevocably proven. The name Eric Metaxas, he is the author that described most of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's work. Witnessing him support Trump, I'd imagine Dietrich Bonhoeffer would shake his head at Eric, who gave into idolatry and ideology that is antichrist, if not undissimilar from Nazism, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer opposed, that same depravity. Again, the serpent had asked Eve, hath God said? 
It's the same principle for all these fallen Christians. When the Holy Spirit leaves them, something else does move in. We certainly get to see this concerning the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate. Instead of following God's word, they twist a perversion to follow concerning trying to justify their sins, especially their sins beforehand, and their malevolence, and their rebellion against God, and in so doing become directly opposed to God because love is not within them. Again, we Christians cannot battle hatred with hatred, but hatred with love and peace, which I'll begin to shortly concerning practical field experience, a practical application. I am reminded of a sermon by Billy Graham entitled, Choices We Make, which was an inspiration for the sermon, incidentally. In the sermon, Billy Graham said, There is a constant battle for your souls going on, all the time. Your soul is important to the devil. He wants your soul. He'll pay any price. Some people sell their souls very cheaply. What profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his soul? The devil will give you the whole world if you follow him. Link in description, by the way, for the sermon. Some people, out of their choices, sell their souls very cheaply. Christian nationalism is a truly perfect example of this, especially with Christians falling and doing everything in their power for power, money, and control. The Russian Orthodox Church under Kirill is doing their holy war against Ukraine as we speak, believing God is on their side, and as we see with worldly devotion throughout world history, this isn't the case and will never be, especially when church and state are unionized. Apathy to evil always appears soon after. The Russian Orthodox Church is subsequently complicit in Putin's war and its atrocities. Again, a Christian cannot have worldly devotion. Those we give, especially to others in whose allegiance we vow to, when it comes to harm others, God will not count as guiltless of negligence, even if we aren't personally part or are partaking. Again, it is absolute evil. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold guiltless. To not speak is to speak. To not act is to act. With that said, when it comes to being of Christ, you cannot be careless with your words and your actions, let alone your oaths and your vows. As Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. So again, those who follow the false doctrine once they are saved, and preach it, and of course belittle harm others, and are unrepentant, again, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. And again, when it comes down to another very important thing, rebuke, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man soweth, that he will also reap. You as a person, as a Christian, are defined by your words and your actions. When it comes to psychology, we humans are creatures of habit. When sins become a daily habit with no change, there is no repentance and unrepentant sins do stack up. We as Christians have to live a life of repentance and change, overcoming our human nature through the strength God gives us through his word and allowing God to have control to submit to God. By submitting to God, we resist the devil. Those who do not do this, however, and desire self-autonomy, they are not of God, especially in their rebellion against God. This quote puts it succinctly. Satan disguises submission to himself under the rules of personal autonomy. He never asks us to become his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules and what I want reigns. And that is the essence of sin. as by an unknown orthodox theologian. As a reminder... What is the definition of Satanism, which many Christians these days, Christian nationalism especially, adhere to? In the Exodus, it explains the month, the answer to Satan's army of fallen angels. Father Gabriel Amaras defines Satanism as, was their objective, Satan's which have helped the forefront of devotion through the theory and practice of three basic principles. You can do all that you wish, knowing as the right to command you, and you are the God yourself. The first principle extends the full liberty to the adherent on everything he wishes to do throughout 
without limits. The second is a release from the principle of authority that is from any obligation to obey parents of church, the state, and whoever places restrictions in the name of the common good. The third denies all the truth that comes directly from the God, paradise, inferno, poetry, judgments, commandments, the precepts of the church, Mary, and so forth. In appearance, these principles are seductive, especially for younger people, because they delude them and think that life is a beautiful holiday and imaginary playthings, where everything is burned where your eye does not recognize any limbs regarding pleasure and enjoyment. Father Gabu Ramarath goes first on this. I wish to conclude with an important observation. It is not necessary to become a Satanist in order to serve the devil and become one of his followers. There are many, alas, who do not officially consecrate themselves to Satan, but choose to follow his basic principles, and as a result, they place their souls at great risk. Link in the description, by the way. So when a Christian believes they can do all that they wish, especially others, such as belittling, trying to dominate, physically harming others, and worse, that no one has authority over them, they don't obey parents, moral authority, government, whoever places legal restrictions, limitations on what they can do, in concern of the common good, and that they are the gods themselves, they are in control, they do not submit to God, these persons are absolutely fallen, without exception. They are in control. They do not submit to God. These persons, again, are absolutely flawed, without exception. They do not repent, and we believe they can harm, dominate others, and believe God allows them. And the Holy Spirit isn't in them. They place their souls at greater risk for their full self-autonomy. Instead of following Christ and the limitations placed on us as Christians, I do from this as a legally ordained reverend. So concerning anger, Dietrich Bonhoeffer states in the Council of Discipleship why anger is anathema to God. The first law which Jesus commands to his disciples is the one which forbids murder and trusts their brother's welfare to their keeping. The brother's life is a divine ordinance that God alone has power over life and death. There is no place for the murderer among the people of God. The judgment he passes on others falls on the murderer himself. In this context, brother means more than fellow Christian. For the follower of Jesus, there can be no limit as to who is his neighbor, except as his Lord decides. He is forbidden to commit murder under pain of divine judgment. For him, the brother's life is a boundary which he dare not pass. Even anger is enough to overstep the mark, still more the casual anger of Raka, and the most of the deliberate insult of the brother, thou fool. Anger is always attacked on the brother's life, but refuses to let him live and aims at his destruction. Jesus will not accept the common distinction between righteous indignation and justified full anger. The disciple must be entirely innocent of anger because anger is offense against both God and his neighbor. Every idle word which we think so little betrays our lack of respect for our neighbor and shows that we place ourselves on the pinnacle above him and value our lives higher than his. An angry word is a blow struck at our brother, a stab at his heart, for he sees hurt and destroy. A deliberate insult is even worse, for we are then openly disgracing our brother in the eyes of the world and cause others to despise him. With our hearts burning with hatred, we seek to annihilate his moral and material existence. We are passing judgment on him, and that is murder, and the murderer will himself be judged. And when a man gets angry with his brother and swears at him, when he publicly insults or slams him, he is guilty of murder and forfeits his relationship to God. He erects a barrier, not only between himself and his brother, but also between himself and God. He no longer has access to him. His sacrifice, worship, and prayer are not acceptable sight. For the Christian, worship cannot be divorced from the service of the brethren, as it was with the rabbis. If we despise our brother, our worship is unreal and it forfeits every divine purpose. Let the fellowship of Christ examine itself and see whether it has given any token of love of Christ to the victim of the world's continual contempt, any token of that love of Christ which seeks to preserve, support, and protect life. Otherwise, however the truly correct our service are, however devote our prayer, however brave our testimony, they will profit us nothing, nay, rather, they must needs testify against us that we have a church and cease to follow our Lord. There is therefore only one way to follow Jesus and worshiping God, and that is to be reconciled to the brethren. If we come before God, or we come before the word, hear the word of God, and receive the sacrament without first being reconciled to the neighbors, we shall come to our own damnation. Again, their worship is unreal when they harm others, and as shown, God will not hear them as long as people have caused against them. And if they make prayer and supplication and go for the sacraments, they condemn themselves to their own damnation as long as people have cause against them. Hatred is a downfall and doom and senseless separation from God. 
Separation from God's spiritual death, which is Lucifer's aim, since he cannot with the conventional war against God, so he will take as many souls with him. As Billy Graham has stated, the devil is after people's souls, and he doesn't care what price he pays for them. Paraphrasing. These fallen Christians, trying to dominate others, and do so many things that are antichrist, we have this here in the U.S., and we are witnessing an ongoing war in Ukraine, hatred, separation from God, as is anger, and Christian nationalists have both in spades. As a refresher, why hatred is dangerous, according to Christianity.com article, why hatred is dangerous by Bethany Barrett. Hatred is defined as the root of evil is rebellion against God, his nature, and his will. People cave into their fleshly desires, whether instinctively or intentionally, when they set themselves against God. The Bible makes it clear that God is love. He is the source of love, the giver of true life, and because of that love will continue into eternity since he is eternal. Hate is a sinful opposition to that love, since the driving force behind much of the wicked action people take, sometimes it is hating others, hating a process, or hating ourselves. God's word has much to say on the topic, emphasizing his toxic influence, penurious nature, and how much it hurts the Lord. It is selfish emotion that sets man against his creator and his brethren, damaging everything it touches because it allows people to see their fellow man as not as made in the image of God. To know the love of God is to be touched by true love, and embracing that enables people to overcome the fleshy drive to hate and become more Christ-like. Many topics the Bible is not sad about, like many topics, is the opposite emotion and behavior that Jesus Christ epitomized when he came to die on the cross, paying the price for the sins of humanity. The dictionary defines it as ill will or resentment, as unusually mutual, prejudice, hostility, or animosity. This definition does not seem to encapsulate hatred as often driving force of the worst of human behavior, including murder, the intentional ending of life. God's word gives many powerful statements about what hate is. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. First John chapter three verse fifteen. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Leviticus nineteen seventeen. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. Proverbs 10, 18. What causes quarrels and fights amongst you? It is not this, that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder, you cover and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 2a. Hate is not just emotion, it is a state of being that involves choices, behaviors, and thoughts. So choices, again. It separates people rather than brings them together because the one hating sets themselves away from another. They cannot do it for superficial reasons, or they do it for superficial reasons, or understandable ones. Racism is an example of hatred driven by ethnic differences. Some people hate others due to religious differences. Individuals often hate one another due to past wrongs, refuse and seek reconciliation. Ultimately, hate can lead to people not seeing the object of their hatred as fully human, justifying bad behavior on either side on either a petty or grand scale. Many people experience anger, but yeah, on either side is true with that. Many people experience anger. Some even have tempers that manifest in ways that are detrimental to their relationships. Getting mad at someone does not mean the relationship is hateful. You in modern psychology identify the difference between the two, with anger being a passing emotion. Even for those who struggle with anger management, hate actively separates people from one another because it is an active decision to otherize it, where that means to view or treat as intrinsically different from an alien to oneself, they refers to someone being seen as so alien to oneself or culture that they can be perceived as lesser, perhaps even less than human. Instead of seeing people as made in the image of God, they can be eliminated. Anger and lead hate and often heals it, but that does not necessarily mean they are the same. Hate drives people to set themselves in opposition to God as well, meaning action driven by hatred are rebellion. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible comes from the New Testament, the last epistle of the New Testament, written by the one of the apostles, John wrote, We know that we are passing from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in First John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. This verse makes it the bold claim that if someone calls themselves a Christian, but is hateful against anyone, especially another believer, they may not have the Holy Spirit, 
and may not be truly saved. Hate is intentionally tied in with death, and just like Jesus called someone embracing lust and adulterer, someone harboring hate is murdering his brother in his heart. When hate is acted upon and leads to death, sometimes as spiritual or relational, unfortunately it can also be the ending of another life of another. Hate is dangerous because when it's taken to its logical conclusion, it is a desire to eliminate the humanity of another. Hatred is direct opposition to God and subsequently hatred is separation from God, no matter the type of hatred, political, racial, gender, gender orientation, sexual orientation. Those who allow hatred to consume and drive them, such as Christian nationalists, again, the Holy Spirit isn't in them and they are Antichrist. Many Christians these days are consumed, dominated by their hatreds, and are walking in perpetual darkness, separated from God by their own hatred, and people are consumed by hatred as say the Holy Spirit is no longer in them. Those who can't accept the lie of the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians chapter 5, verses 23, 23. In their daily lives, the Holy Spirit isn't in them. The Holy Spirit isn't longer in those consumed by hatred. Something else has replaced it in them. The spirit of hate and the spirit of anger, amongst other things concerning exorcism, church, doctrinal views. Again, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, etc. all count as hatred regardless is active rebellion against God. Those who fail majesty aren't Christians, officially otherwise, and I have to affirm this as a legal or a reverend. Should those who follow majesty be excommunicated, following the stages of church discipline, and kicked out of Christianity in the entirety until they repent and atone? Absolutely. For they aren't of the body of Christ. They are religious, but follow Lucifer's three principles in the belief that they can do all that they wish to others, especially those that they hate that no one has authority over them, that they are the gods themselves, they do not submit to God, nor God's plan, let alone follow Jesus' commandments, especially love others, and so they rebel against God. It is a deliberate choice, rebellion. Those who rebel against God aren't of Christ either. With repentance and change, they can become as new in the image of God, so that at, that is the point when they can be welcomed back as part of the body of Christ. So again, what is the majesty? Majesty in God's image is encapsulated in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17-21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know, or anyone who does not love, does not know God, because God is love. And this is love of God was made manifest among us, that God sends only Son in the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, sent Son, the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loves, we also also love one another. Now, has ever seen God? If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is a perfect in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us the Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent Son to be saved of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Everyone says, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. First John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. When it comes to majesty in God's image, according to church this doctrine, racism, xenophobia, hatred in general is a moral evil. According to late Archbishop Harry J. Flynn, in, his, in the image of God, pastoral letter racism, he describes majesty and anti-majesty as, In our national pastoral letter on racism, we bishops know how racism is a rejection of the most basic values of scriptures. God's word proclaimed the oneness of the human family from the first words of Genesis to the come Lord Jesus of the book of Revelation. God's word in Genesis announces that all men and women are created in God's image, not just some races and racial types, but all by the imprint of the creator and are enlivened by the breath of his one spirit. Racism mocks the word of Jesus. Treat others as you would have them treat you. Indeed, racism is more than a disregard for the words of Jesus. It is a denial of the truth of the dignity of each human being revealed by the mystery of the Incarnation. Those words remind us how serious racism violates God's will for us. It contradicts the meaning of the Incarnation and threatens our salvation. In the Incarnation, Jesus entered human history and transcended and transformed the divisions of human sinfulness. He calls us to communion with one another, a union that reflects the unity of God's own being in the Holy Trinity. In his life, Jesus modeled this unity in deep reverence for the dignity of each person he met. 
Whether it was a Samaritan woman, the tax collector, the leper, or the prostitute, Jesus treated all people with the reverence that is due as children of God. <clears throat> if we are to follow the example of Jesus, then we must be keenly aware that every person is formed in the image and likeness of God. Every person must be treated with a deep reverence and respect. For we are all sons and daughters of the one God in whose sacredness we share. God intends that we all live in harmony, that we practice a love that unites us and reflects our fundamental equality as human beings. Racism is a serious offense against God precisely because it violates the innate dignity of the human person. At its core, racism is a failure to love your neighbor. Since we cannot claim to love God unless we have love our neighbor, we can only be one with God if we reject racism and work aggressively to remove it from our personal lives, our church, our society. Pope John Paul II, an important teacher doctrine on Ecclesia in America, reminds us every offense against the dignity of a person is an offense against God himself, in whose image human beings are made. This dignity is common to all, without exception, since all have been created in the image of God. See Genesis 126. Jesus answered the question used by neighbor. Luke 10, 29, demands each individual an attitude of respect for the name of others and the real concern for them, even if they are strangers. Luke chapter 10, verses 3 through 37. Responding to the sin of racism must begin with each of us examining our own lives on the subject. We need to be open to change of heart. We should ask God's Spirit to remove from us all traces of racial prejudice. We should avoid racial stereotypes, slurs, and jokes. We should correct any expressions or racist attitudes among family members. This is very important. Friends and co-workers, we should seek opportunities to know and learn from people of other races. Resisting racism also means examining our basic insects and assumptions about race. How can these assumptions shape our daily lives? What are our fears about people of other races? Link in the description, by the way. And this is very important. We should avoid racial stereotypes and jokes, and we have to correct those, especially in our family who do such things. So, for example, some people may have... Uh, family in their lives who are devout Christians, keyword, devout is a keyword, but of course those same ones who listened to fear-mongering, k-mongering, became idolaters, Trump supporters, and started making racial and racist jokes that they never made in their entirety in the life of that person. Again, so seeing that corruption, that unrepentantness, and that malevolence, maliciousness, again, we as Christians have to correct it. We cannot be apathetic to evil, and I'll be getting about this a little bit later. I am already two hour mark, and I'm a little more than halfway done now, finally. Mm -hmm. Father Gabriel Amorth goes a bit further than this in an exorcist that explains the demonic, the antic of Satan, and the army of fallen angels. The essential question is what is the concrete rapport that each man has with God? As I have mentioned, the solemn response is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the saved, the damned will be chosen on the basis of their recognition or rejection of Christ in the infirm, in the hungry, and in the poor. See Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 46. Two essential elements emerge from this. The first division, a schism between those going to paradise and those going to hell between the saved and the condemned. The second regards a man in which this judgment will be accomplished with love. God's commandments and every other precept are summed up solely in one commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, John 15, 12. We can easily understand that this commandment is addressed to each human conscious in every age, including those who lived before Christ and those who today, as in centuries past, never heard anyone speak of the Son of Man. Therefore, the finale of this stupendous passage is the beautiful passage in Matthew. Truly I say to you, as you did to the one least of these of my brethren, you did so unto me, Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. If each man, apart from his religion, his culture, his epoch, and other circumstance, has loved his neighbor, he has also loved the Lord Jesus in person. Any rapport, our brothers and sisters, in any locality, any age, any situation is, all in all, a rapport with Jesus Christ in person. Each human creature who achieves fulfillment of his human relationships is, at the same time, related to God. For this reason, the love of thy neighbor is the fundamental precept of life. John the Evangelist helps us to understand that we cannot say that we love God, whom we cannot see, if we do not love our brother, whom we can see. See 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. The love that will judge us will be the same love that we have or have not practiced towards others, the same love that Jesus lived his earthly experience, 
and taught us in the Gospels the same love to which we are entitled through the sacraments, the prayer, and through a life of faith. The ability to love comes from grace and is much reduced in those who do not know Christ, and even more so in who know him but do not follow him, a choice that assumes a serious sin. Indeed, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. On the other hand, it is now extraordinary jubilee of mercy. Pope Francis reminds us that the other fundamental aspect of the question is that the love with which we shall be judged will be the love of mercy. Mercy is the ultimate and supreme act in which God comes to meet us. This mercy, he says, is the bridge that connects God and man and opens our hearts to the hope of being loved forever despite our sinfulness. God's compassionate glance and his desire to live in total communion with us opens our hearts to the hope that each sin and each failure inflicted on man by his great enemy, Satan, will be looked upon in the eyes of a loving and accepting father. Therefore, let us live full of hope because we know that even in the most difficult seas of our life's journey, God will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. On that day, death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, nor any more. For the former things have passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. Link the description, by the way. Again, when hatred, bitterness is allowed to enter the person's heart, it does transform them into something they are not. Again, we see this. Read this. Listen to this. What we consume, we become. Those listening, hate-mongering, fear-mongering, many Christians here in America fell. 7% plus American Christians. Many of whom became Christian nationalists are no longer Christ due to fang Majesty day, becoming a worldly devotion, falling into idolatry, amongst numerous other things, and the Holy Spirit leaving them. Their hatred separating them from God, which is Lucifer's aim to begin with. Father Gamera Amos Summers says succinctly, Satan's mission is well explained in the Apostle Peter. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We can trip this devouring as doing harm, bringing to perdition. The devil's mission in the world is to seduce souls, to lead each man and woman on the wayward path to sin, and the principal oath of this tragic mission is a path to temptation. Each one of us must fight against the temptation of sin for as long as we live. Indeed, sin is lost to death. It should not be surprised to anyone, and I shall speak of it shortly, if I say there are more victims of Satan's ordinary action than men of his extraordinary action. We are all victims of temptation, but only some are victims of extraordinary action than Satan, but never through their own fault, therefore they are not morally responsible. Temptation assaults us each holy day. Jesus himself submitted the temptation in the 40 days he spent in the desert after his baptism of journey. See Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. And later on, the devil tempts us both in our natural dimension, that is, in our interior wounds and weaknesses, and through the various occasions of sin that present themselves to us. Temptation is dangerous, and through the various occasions of sin that present themselves to us, temptation is dangerous because it is difficult to uncover in the folds of our thoughts, words, works and omissions. Discernment is necessary, that is, we must have a well-trained eye and spiritual intelligence that helps us to recognize the call of the tempter and who will bring us straight to sin. We must reject them and instead accept the good inspirations that come from God. Therefore, it's necessary to guard our heart and our external senses from indecent spectacles. Each of us becomes what we see, what we listen to, and what we read. Therefore, let us be discerning in what we see and listen to, and above all, let us have good friends. It's necessary to have well-formed conscience. A good conscience is not achieved by elevating oneself for it. Worse yet, it is necessary to have a well-informed conscience. A good conscience is not achieved by elevating oneself for worse yet, allowing the dominant culture to arbitrate good and bad. A good conscience is obtained by conforming one's will to God's will and his teachings, which are given to us for our happiness and our salvation are summarized in the highest degree in the commandments. Temptation is conquest by vigilance, avoiding sin, and praying, because without the help of God, we are not capable of conquering the seduction of sin. No one is exempt from temptation. Some of the saints had, had tremendous temptations even on their deathbeds. From their testimonies, we understand that as long as we have breath, we shall never be free of temptation. The loss of the sense of sin that characterizes our error helps Satan act nearly undisturbed and inducing man to sin, takes man progressively away from the love of God. Everything is awful. What is wrong there? Everyone does it. These are the suggestions that weaken the consciousness of men and women lead them in the past towards their closing their hearts, egoism, lack of forgiveness, and doing everything for money, power, and sex. Everything that seduces and saves souls leads to their death, which is Satan's objective. The orient temptations of the devil are played mainly in the area of intelligence. Let us think of the 
Many theoretical errors are passed off as morality and ordinary hinge principles of the faith. All the new lifestyles that are contrary to morality, what is the cause of moral decline? Principally, the dominion of the Christian conscience and the struggle against the powers of darkness is St. Paul had warned us, for we are not contending against the flesh and blood, but against the principality, against the powers, against the rule, world rules of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Ephesians 6 12. Here is how Vatican II frames the situation. When the order of values is jumbled in the bad makes of the good, the individual the group of faith heeds solely to their own interests and not to those of others, thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. In our own day, the magnified power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. For the monumental struggle against the powers of darkness to the whole history of man, the battle is during the very origin of the world and can continue until the last day. And as the Lord has attested, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 13, 13, 20, 30, 36, 43, causes this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly if he is clean to what is good, nor can he achieve his own integrity without great efforts and the help of God's grace. We get the scripture, by the way. When people fall, craving power, etc., and believe those they hate are less than human, again, Antichrist, in line with the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate, dominate them to the point of them harming others, fallen and worse. Again, when a Christian believes in the three basic principles of Satanism, that they can do all they wish, especially others, that knows authority over them, that they are the gods of themselves, they do not submit to God, they cannot resist the devil, they place themselves knowingly or otherwise in great spiritual peril. Then again, Lucifer uses those hate in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. So how do you handle people who make these choices to harm others in some way? When it comes to personal experience and field experience concerning minor exorcism, consecrations, concerning dealing with people with the choices that they make, there are two recent incidents I had to experience and I made two different choices concerning church doctrine. At my day job several days ago, one of my co-workers who was a veteran, he has PD PTSD, and there are instances where he blows up verbally at people, either co-workers or even customers at times. It isn't necessarily his fault the psychological triggers occurred and he lashed out angrily. Some of my co-workers got yelled at even happened to me on more than one occasion too. He's apologized profusely for the outburst afterwards. That particular day it did trigger, I asked him how he was doing, he was having concentration issues, as is typical of most cases concerning PTSD, and thanks to my question, he couldn't particularly concentrate enough to on a simple task and lashed out verbally. I had thought of what to do afterwards concerning the incident and the person in general. The answer was very simple. Forgiveness and compassion. This is what it means to be of Christ. An hour or so afterwards, I talked to him and told him that I forgave him and that I do understand. It's PTSD. We fist bumped. I'm ex Navy myself. So I do have compassion and that person is a brother through service to country. I do pray particularly for that coworker of mine for healing for him, both mental and physical. In that instance, I chose reconciliation, compassion, forgiveness, and peace, and love. We Christians have to seek reconciliation. About more than three weeks ago, however, I had made a different choice entirely for a different person. Thanks to the vows I took in duty, I have to follow in the course of church doctrine and the church doesn't plan I'm given. A bit over three weeks ago, at my day job, my day job hired a problematic person, a narcissist, who doesn't get the mental health help he needs. Who belittles others and far worse, fully believing he can do all that he wishes and that no one has authority over him and that he is the God of himself. Exactly that. First day on the job, he'd been fired several times and usually lasted two to three weeks before being fired again. Already belittling others, but other than that, a minor nuisance. The lies Those who live a life of in direct opposition to Christ, though him, he he particular, those who live a life of opposition to Christ, though a Roman Catholic at one point religiously, that's particularly troublesome person. Which, of course, him, like other Christians or those that are fallen Christians who harm others, are under my watch. Concerning shepherding and taking steps as necessary when it comes to correction, if not directly intervening 
in what they do concerning others, especially if I'm around. I cannot be apathetic to evil, complacent or complicit evil, so I am bound to intervene regardless as part of my vows and oaths. So him following the general principle of Satanism meant I would have to follow my training in dealing with him from a spiritual aspect. The next day I wore my necklace with a vial of blessed anointing oil with my usual accoutrements. I also initiated my first regimen of consecration prayers, house blessings, a typical consecration prayers, and minor exorcism prayers. When he came in, I told him flatly that is narcissism, and with his narcissism, it still doesn't give him the right to harm others, and told him that my other hat, ordained reverend, is on in that moment. He knows I'm legally ordained outside of the day job. Saying that I do not like to mix my worlds, but God places us specifically where he needs us, regardless if we wish to or not, for we have to minister, witness, help those around us. I told him I'd give him three warnings before I would have to do what I had to do, if God allowed. Within a couple hours, I had gone past my two warnings, so I initiated the second set of consecration prayers. After the second set of consecration prayers, the particular individual started claiming that the place, area, atmosphere was toxic to him, and he was incredibly sick. However, things didn't end there for him. Everything that could go wrong in the shift happened, primarily only to him. He did leave early that day, though. This was repeated for a week on a daily basis. He would go past my second warning and I'd initiate the second regimen of consecration prayers. He'd fall ill and fall ill and whatever bad things that could happen or go wrong during a shift would, but only to him. There was an aversion to holy, so a vexation at any rate, which the initial identification is individuals who are disrupting Christians slash the church. It happened exactly like clockwork. On the final day of that week, and after the second regimen, and all the bad that would happen, stuff that could go wrong and did, but only to that person, he stated, don't jinx me, concerning my statement about him accidentally dropping his phone in water after maintenance. I told him that I don't jinx. I've been asked even by some narcissists if I, as a legal or ordained reverend, jinx curse a person when I state what is going to happen to that person after they've done what they've wanted to others and I prayed immediately afterwards concerning that particular person doing the harming and time afterwards the said person that was doing the harm got consequences which the person doing the asking had gotten to witness firsthand. I don't jinx got no power whatsoever and certainly got no say in anything that happens but I do give the person doing the harm to God and God singles them out for correction discipline what God deems necessary to do and I cannot intervene or interfere in what happens. So no personal power and no control whatsoever because God is in control. As I've stated, I did state to him correctly, because of his actions, he himself is liable to judgment. And specifically, the law of consequences concerning harming others and believing he can harm others. The expression on his face, eyes widening with realization and the realization of everything that was happening to him did dawn on him. Only a few of my co-workers were aware of what I was doing and keeping tabs on the proceedings and the problematic person was informed, wasn't conscious of the consecrations, what I had to do after the warnings until the moment of realization. The reality when it comes to consecration prayers, do not go in expecting anything to happen. God is in control of what happens since he literally sends his presence there and you yourself have absolutely zero power or control whatsoever because God is in control and God is working through you. So that same day, on the final day of that week, I did a full consecration ceremony and anointed the building with blessed anointing oil. The problematic person stopped showing up. He did initially show up for only two specific days I wasn't working and behaved himself, or so I was told, but I was also informed of how ill he felt being there, the effects of holy. He stopped showing up for a few weeks and was subsequently fired. He was under observation by others, specifically people of faith, whom I work with and who actually knew what was up. They've had to witness, deal with stuff after I get or choose to be spiritually involved. With thanks to the fact I can't be apathetic to evil concerning the harm of others, so I usually inform. When it comes to doing a consecration following the full procedure, laws and rules, it was my first successful consecration. I actually did have to confer with a pastor I know 
who has had more years under the belt in exorcism professionally, some time afterwards, concerning what I did and all the actions I took except the procedures I followed. At the end of the day, what I did was correct and justified. I do have people I answer to, and I have those who hold me to accountability, especially if I go above limitations. My vows dictate I have to protect others, especially spiritually, from those who would harm them. I, as a legally ordained reverend, have to shepherd others. In that particular instance, a disruption to holy was immediately identified, and I couldn't be apathetic to evil and what was going on. Warnings were given, and corrective action taken after identification, cause, and effect. So following training with the intent, desire for the individual to change, heal, or be removed, the latter part happened. The person being exiled, banished, the banishment of evil. Since that was what was in them, since what was in them had an aversion to holy and I wasn't doing a major exorcism to deal with what was in them, I don't mess with major exorcism, I'm not brave in that, unlike the said pastor I know who is. This wasn't a major exorcism, minor since I followed the dictates, rules, protocols, procedures for minor exorcism. Though the individual certainly needs a major exorcism and certainly needs a mental health help too, narcissism is a diagnosed personality disorder concerning DSM-5. I do not like the mission I'm given, but I'm very obedient, God's in control. However, church doctrine is there for a reason. There is no such thing as coincidence, only certainty. My own field experiences in my short time in ministry certainly show, especially to myself, why church doctrine has to be followed, specifically in Matthew's day. Another reason why I teach doctrine as a preceptor in our perceptual theology, because I have to warn and admonish and rebuke. For I do not condemn the people, but the actions, since again, everyone can be redeemed, everyone can repent and change, and it's never too late to change. Condemning others is denying Jesus' ability to save, which is placing the Lord's name in vain, which is always leads to spiritual peril. Again, if I want to look for signs of demonization, I have to look, all I have to look is as hatred, man time, man just day, who and why. Same applies to those who rebel against God, hatred is separation from God. The belief you can dominate and control others is Antichrist, which is why Christian nationalism is Antichrist and why it has to be confronted by peaceful means, prayer and nonviolence, especially through legal accountability. Through legal accountability, the person tells for their actions, they get the mental health help they desperately need, they get to know of Christ, they get to repent, change for the better, and be forgiven, ultimately, which is why accountability is love. To do so, otherwise, as well as apathy to evil, complicity to complacent to evil, in which God will not count guiltless, as well as the sin of partiality. In the book of James, James talks about the sin of partiality. If you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. And this is why the false doctrine of one saved all saved these people are fallen because they continually do the sin of partiality. And they're unrepentant, and God counts them guilty as all. They're still unrepentant and they're rebelling, and again, that's separation, which is spiritual death. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who has said, Do not commit adultery, but also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. James chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Speaking of peaceful means, again, when it comes to praying, invoking God, and invoking God's help, you need to be very careful and also very specific, especially with your intent. God will answer in accordance with what is in your heart. If it is good, of love, of peace, and desire for change, if not deliverance, God will answer you. When it comes to my own two recent instances and the decisions I have to make, and when it comes in general to making decisions and choices, always be loving, kind, and compassionate. This is what I have to strive for, especially thanks to taking the Hippocratic Oath. The latest incidents, which was the first talked about, was that was where was peace, compassion, and forgiveness was given, as it was 
for what Kirsten has to do. The second one, however, which is the first incident of the two, a different solution had to be implemented for a person who refuses to change and gave into temptation inside to harm others a solution of peaceful means. Word of God, prayer was implemented. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And this is what we have to follow. So by peaceful means, the situation was solved with a corrective solution. I never gave to my own human nature its desires to return evil for evil, belittling for belittling. Instead, I followed church doctrine and training in invoking. For God is in control, and I have zero power or control whatsoever, and had my first truly successful consecration, I trusted God with what had to happen and was subsequently utilized. My intent was for change, healing, removal, protection of others. Again, what you do to others matters as does what you say to others. Jesus specifically states this. I tell you, on the day of judgment, you will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 37. When it comes to being a Christian, you have to be a peace teacher. Bonhoeffer says in this quote, why? The followers of Christ have been called to peace, and they must not only have peace, but make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence or atonement. In the cause of Christ, nothing is being by such methods. His disciples keep the peace by choosing their suffering themselves rather than inflict it on others. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of world war and hate. As Billy Graham has said, if you surrender to God, he will give you the power to overcome your sins. This is certainly true. In the book of Ezekiel, God has said to the prophet concerning his children, which applies directly to us as Christians, when we become of Christ and the Holy Spirit fills us, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27. God will give you a new heart when you follow him. Obey the Lord Jesus Christ, tens and testaments to the letter. If you exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. God will give you options to use other than sinning, harming others. Pray to God for help, and according to your heart, he will deliver. This is what happened with a problematic person. After the first day of him being back, I prayed to God how I should handle him and what should I do with him. Him harming others means I will directly have to make certain, by legal and spiritual means, there is a stop to it, according to my vows and oaths. The answer came soon after. To treat him as I would a fallen Christian, a Christian nationalist, or someone possessed, dominated by the spirit of hate, spirit of anger, following rules, regulations, protocols concerning the Roman right. The problematic person only lasted a week and a half at most, not even as usual two weeks. God's solutions won't take the form you would expect. There is a plan. God utilizes people and will utilize you, provided you fully submit to it as well. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 13 in the Standard Version. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about God giving you strength when you need strength. 
for he will provide your needs and will give you deliverance, courage, and aptitude. By exemplifying the fruits of the Spirit in your daily life, the Holy Spirit certainly provides spiritual discernment and more. If you cannot exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in your daily life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gifts, faithfulness, and self-control, the Holy Spirit certainly isn't there. Again, there is a very clear divide concerning who is a Christian and who isn't. Seven percent of American Christians are no longer of Christ. As stated, I don't do major exorcisms, I do minor exorcisms, and as previously stated in my last sermon, considering I do consecration a lot more these days and don't mess with major exorcisms, and not that I don't keep tabs on a person's nature and if the Holy Spirit is in them, then what exactly it is, excluding mental health issues. Again, things are much simpler than they would like to prefer, and yes, the realization is very scary concerning what exactly is driving people to hate and harm others. This is the main reason why I follow church doctrine and training. Again, those of hatred, Christian nationalists, racist, xenophobic extremists aren't of Christ. Those who are of Christ are of love, for God is love, and all of us are created in God's image, imagine this day. So let's take a look at another recent Christian nationalist incident this week concerning the spirit of hate that so permeates and dominates so many of them, unfortunately. According to Alternate.org's article, these people should be put to death. Right wing preacher calls for execution or, ex or executing LGBT plus, plus Americans. A Texas based Christian extremist preacher is calling on the government to round up every single homosexual, put them on trial, convict them, and put them to death by shooting them in the head, which he falsely says Jesus Christ commands. Bill Nauz of the Steadfast Baptist Church on Sunday also falsely claimed every gay person is a pedophile, every heterosexual pedophile is a fag, and every and sodomites are every, and sodomites are responsible for school shootings. And I do apologize for all these words, by the way. But this is in the article which that person did speak. And so, yes, again, again, that anger, those attacks on people with those words. God would not count any of that guiltless. He does count that as murder. Again, be very careful with what you do or say to others. You really need to, because your spiritual security depends on it. And again, false doctrine once saved, always saved is false for reasons. The devil's doctrine, because those adherents of it, again, they follow the three principles of Satanism, and knowingly or otherwise, they are Satanists by default, because again, following his three basic principles makes them. They're not officially, but they are still enthralled either way. And this is how it is, unfortunately. So he says, Sodom is responsible for school shootings. None of those claims are factual. What does God say is the answer is the solution for the homosexual 2022? In the testament here in the book of Romans, Oz asked, is reported by only skies, Hemant Metha, that they are worthy of death. These people should be put to death. I know that person should be put in an institution and excommunicated and rounded up and put in prison for that matter. It's a threat to others. It's a threat to society. Again, this is the point. You have to deal with them by peaceful means. This is why legal accountability is necessary. But so is exorcism. Okay. And this is why it's important. It's identifying the type of demonic spirits and entities that drive these people to harm others, to despise others. Because again, spiritual trauma. A Texas-based Christian extremist preacher is calling on the government to round up every single homosexual, put them in trial, convict them, put them to death by shooting them in the head, which he falsely says Jesus commands. The Bible says nothing about shooting anyone in the back of the head, as guns has not been invented the Bible was written. Many oppose capital punishment, but some citing the biblical commandment of thou shalt not kill, claim often used to fight abortion, but not guns. Some theologians also dispute the passage of the Bible that condemn homosexuality, others recognize that the law in the Bible cannot apply to modern life, and in fact it would be unlawful to do so. The steadfast Baptist Church appears in the Southern Poverty Law Center's list of anti-LGBT hate groups.
Hatred, regardless of if it be political, racial, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, is still hatred, and that's to God and separation from God, which is spiritual death. Those who fail not just stay, so racist even folks aren't Christians, officially those, and I have to affirm this as a legal ordained reverend. They are fallen, cast away, and to be treated as such, and excommunicated as necessary. Again, when it comes to Christian nationalism, when a Christian again preaches hatred, maliciousness, and malevolence, the Holy Spirit isn't in them, but they are being dominated by the spirit of hate, spirit of anger, following church doctrine and signs of demonization according to exorcism or the kinds of demonic spirits. You cannot try to call yourself a Christian and be malevolent. The Holy Spirit isn't in them. They are not of Christ nor God or Christian. Officially or otherwise, and after this is legal ordained reverend. It is mixing the good with the bad, and as Father Gabriel says, here is how the Vatican II frames the situation. When the order of values are jumbled and bad is mixed with the good, individuals and group pray who solely their own interests and not those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood, in our own day, the magpie power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. In the monumental struggle against the powers of doctrines pervades the whole human history of man, the battle is drawn from the very origin of the world and will continue until the last day as the Lord attested. Caught in this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly if he is to cling to what is good, nor can he achieve his own integrity without grave efforts and the help of God's grace. Link in the description, by the way. <clears throat> Again, when the good mixes with the bad, corruption and worse ensure leading to depravity and infinitely worse concerning de de domination and demonization for that matter by spirit of hate and spirit of anger and those types of demonic spirits that attempt to give demonic suggestions for the person to harm others also as stated a demon cannot make a person do anything they wouldn't already want to do the person can always choose not to do the decision to sin harm others as mother Teresa once said if a person believes they can kill someone what does to stop them from killing anyone? She was talking about abortion, but the same can be applied to harming others, which again is classified as sin. Again, as previously stated, it is irrevocably proven that Lucifer uses a hate and heart to the unspeakable evils when it comes to making choices. You always have the option to not do the choice that would harm others. When people have hatred in their hearts, they create barriers between themselves and God and become spiritual and separated from God, which is spiritual death, which is Lucifer's aim to claim their souls. Lucifer uses those hate in their hearts the unspeakable evils, this is irrevocably proven time and again. Which is Lucifer's aim to claim their souls. Lucifer uses those hatred in the hearts of the unspeakable evils. This is irrevocably proven time and again. Again, these types of fallen Christians are cast away to be excommunicated until they repent in a town, which is why they are to be held legally accountable. Should Pastor Dylan Oz, like Pastor Greg Locke and other fallen Christians, be excommunicated, lose his pastorship, and be exorcised? Again, when I say exorcised, I mean exorcism. The spirit of hate and spirit of anger inside of him, like so many others, and made to be given mental health help they desperately need? Absolutely. Until repentance, change, and atonement happens, they will be continued to be used knowingly or otherwise by the opposition to God, the unspeakable evils or they will grieve the Holy Spirit for the last time, and God will take them out. Which happened in my town's local street preacher during the height of the pandemic, who preached, taught hatred, xenophobic, like the said Christian nationalist, and anti majesty so anti-Christ in that aspect, since God is love. The said preacher was an idolater too, and was anti-mask, anti-vax. It was thanks to his hatred that I vowed to become ordained and I did. I asked God to take care of him so I wouldn't have to. I was in prayer at the time less than a year into my ordination. God answered, and the late street preacher unfortunately didn't last a delta variation of the pandemic. He grieved the Holy Spirit and tested God. God answered, which again is why I choose to give people to God as a last resort concerning correction. At least concerning the problematic person recently enough, God gave me the option of minor exorcism to deal with the situation. Because God is in control. God said his presence. God did as he did. And if anything, I just invoked God and got to watch the results as they happened from several minutes on. So above all, pray for racists, xenophobes, and those that are dominated by the spirit of faith that God heals our hearts, minds, bodies, souls have to repent to him before it's healing and are forgiven. You yourself have to forgive others, but repentance change is required, otherwise it is cheap grace. 
which is damnation in itself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, concerning cheap grace, instead of following Christ, let the Christian enjoy the consolations of his grace. That is what we mean by cheap grace, the grace which amounts to justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin parts. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from the toils of sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preacher who forgives without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living in incarnate. When it comes down to praying for others, especially those who harm others, God will change them, though it may take hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. Prayer is love for his intercession between Jesus and God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer states, Why is it born for, Christ, for Christians to pray to those opposed to God? Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I guess this is a supreme command. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. Jesus does not promise that when we bless our enemies and do good to them, they will not despitefully use and persecute us. They certainly will. But not even that can hurt or overcome us, so long as we pray for them. For if we pray for them, we are taking their distress and poverty, their guilt, and perdition upon ourselves, and pleading to God for them. We are doing vicariously for them that they cannot do for themselves. Every insult they utter only serves to bind us more closely to God and them. Their persecution of us only serves to bring them nearer to reconciliation with God and to further triumphs of love. Link the description, by the way. So you as a Christian have to combat the evils of this world with love, peace, compassion, and forgiveness. When it comes to your decisions, the final test of your decisions have to be predicated on, is it of love? Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the love, one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Be watchful, stand firm in faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. These two verses exemplify the choices you as a Christian have to make. Is it of love? Again, love does no wrong to your neighbor. Remember that. This is a life a Christian has to live, to be of love, to be compassionate, and to be of peace. So if you are of love, you are of God. If you aren't of love and can't follow, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. You true are truly fallen, especially in belief. Of you can do all that you wish. No one has authority over you, and you are the God of yourself. Again, the three basic principles of Satanism, guess what? They've damned themselves. So again, you as a Christian have to pray for them. Correct as necessary. And safeguard their souls. Save them from themselves. This is most important, because they cannot be abandoned. Again, we have to repent daily to change. We can't battle the temptations in our human nature on our own. Only by submitting to God can we resist the devil and overcome our own nature. So when it comes to those who preach, teach hatred, especially treat, preach the false doctrine to once saved, always saved, like that particular pastor, warning number two, hmm. pray for them of course, exorcism may be needed, but excommunication is warranted. Also hold them to legal accountability when it comes to Christian nationalism, confronting it, and living the life of Jesus deems us to. I am reminded of a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Those who love the dream of a Christian community more than they love the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. God hates this wishful dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. Those who dream of this idolized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands set up by their own law, and they judge one another and God accordingly. It is not we who build. Christ builds the church. Whoever is mindful to build the church is surely well on the way of, to destroying it. For he will build a temple to idols without wishing or knowing. We must confess he builds. We must proclaim. You must complain. 
We must proclaim he builds. We must pray to him and he will build. We do not know his plan. We cannot see whether he is building or pulling down. It may be that the times which by human standards are the times of collapse are for him the great times of construction. It may be the times which from a human point are great times for the church. Our times when pulling down is great comfort when Jesus brings and gives to his church. You confess, preach, bear witness to me, and I alone will build where it pleases me. Do not meddle in what is not your providence. Do what is given to you, and do it well, and you will have done enough. Live together and forgive them for your sins. Forgive each other every day from the bottom of your hearts. Link the description, by the way. This is the point. Those, especially Christian nationalists, that become so religious, hath God said, asked the serpent Eve, with their beliefs, ideas, and desire to dominate control others, which we are prohibited by Jesus to, thus limitations, became destroyers of the church Christian community. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to witness the churches in Germany become apathetic to evil, and ultimately they became complicit evil and selling their souls to and Lucifer utilizing them, and we saw the results, the final solution, genocide. We are witnessing this in Ukraine, and we at least experiencing a bit of it here in America, and certainly did during the four years of Trump. Those who supported Trump and Christian nationalists in general won't be counted guiltless in all the harm that happened to others due to policies, racist dog and other actions, unless they repent for the town, especially, and specifically, that idolatry. Again, either or. Either you love God and follow all Jesus' commands and testaments, the letter, or you love the world and are absolutely and subsequently enthralled in worldly devotion. Again, when it comes to when fallen Christians breach the limits God placed on them, there is always law of consequences which is enacted. Those who follow the false doctrines once saved, always saved in cheap grace, cry about persecution in our cancel culture, however God uses people to ensure justice is enacted. When we do wrong, the victims of these fallen Christians get to make the decision what is to be done with them. Which is why Christians who believe they can harm others have to repent and seek reconciliation with their accusers before seeking sacraments. God will not hear them since they worship him as real. Otherwise, that act leaves them to their own damnation. Again, the reality is, God gives warning before he acts and enacts punishment since the father does have to discipline his children to make people to change. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you, sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. So at the end of the day, the Christian nationalist desire to dominate isn't of Christ nor God, and again, they are liable for judgment, especially by non-believers and by their victims, both outside of intercession. I cannot interfere in intervene in people's fates. Your choices and how you treat others does and always will matter. Speaking of domination and fallen Christians trying to use justify their to their own ends, Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us about the Christian church and Christians in general. When it comes to working towards the salvation of Christians who fall, fallen Christians, we have to work towards their salvation even if saving them from themselves at times concerning having to hold them to legal accountability when they harm others. The brother is a burden to the Christian precisely because he is a Christian. For the pagan, the other person never becomes a burden at all. He simply sidesteps every burden that others may impose upon him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together, a Catholic Exploration of Christian Community. Which I also actually have that by the way, too, by the way. When it comes to majesty and the fact Christians cannot dominate others, God did not make this person as I would have made him. He did not give him to me as a brother for me to dominate control, but in order that I might find above him the creator. Now the other person in the freedom in which he was created becomes the occasion of joy, whereas before it was only a nuisance and an affliction. God does not will that I should fashion the other person according to the image that seems good to me, that is, in my own image. Rather, in his very freedom for me, God made this person in his image. I can never know before and how God's image should appear to others. That image is always manifest a completely new and unique form that comes solely from God's free and sovereign creation. To me, the sight may seem strange, even ungodly, but God creates every man in the likeness of the Son, Son crucified. After all, 
Even that image certainly looks strange and ungodly. Me before I grasp it, that's a huge Bonhoeffer, Life Together, Classic Inspiration, and Christian Humanity. The church is a church that only exists when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell every man of every calling what it means to live for Christ to exist for others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Letters and Papers from Prison. When it comes to how you treat others, when you receive accountability for your actions, God, God uses others to make it so. Sometimes you will encounter angels as well. When dealing with people day to day, you have no knowledge of what exactly or whom you are dealing with. This is why you have to be very, very careful with how you treat others. This is double meaning majesty in God's image. Jesus stands at the door knocking, Revelation 3.20, told totally reality he comes before in the form of the beggar of the desolate human town around clothes, asking for help. He confronts you with every person that you meet as long as there are people. Christ will walk the earth as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls upon you, speaks to you, makes demands of you. This is the great seriousness, the great blessings to have a message. Christ is standing at the door. He lives in the form of a human being among us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, God is in the manger. God created the law of consequences of the first universal law after the fall of man, original sin, to counter our negative actions. There are many pastors, preachers out there who teach, preach hatred, who also have to be held accountable. Again, law of consequences. We as Christians are to be held highly liable to judgment. The Christian, in fact, does not have the special privilege or power to dominate and control others if they are actually of Christ, have the Holy Spirit in them. Again, you as a Christian have to be very, very careful to what you do to others. Again, God knows your thoughts and counts every hateful thought as sin to begin with. You are born again Christian, cannot justify your sin beforehand either, no matter how you try to justify your hatred of another person, it is still considered an anathema to God, and you are counted as an open rebellion against God and are separated from him. Hatred is itself its own damnation. Further then, if you have been raised in Christ, seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ with God. When Christ is in your life, it appears. When you also appear in the glory, put to death, therefore, what is earthly you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, like which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. If these you two once walked, then you will be living in them. But now you must put all away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that... You have put off the old self, which with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, no Jew, circumcised, nor circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, forgiveness, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you may be forgiven. And above all, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful let the word of christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to god and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus christ giving thanks to god the father through him colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the help of the righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcised nor uncircumcised counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You are running well. What? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven, leaven's whole lump. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view, and that no one is troubling you of bear count whoever he is. For if I, brothers, will preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you are called for freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled with one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's Galatians chapter one, verses five through Yeah, Galatians chapter five, verses one through fourteen. Sorry about the screw up there. I know it's like my first screw up in three hour plus sermon. <laughs> Theological I by now. <sighs> and this is why I try to take a couple breaks from there. I'm gonna say a couple breaks, I mean like uh a week and a half to two weeks from having to do very, very, very lengthy these dies. 
When it comes to summarizing what is currently happening spiritually, both these verses were very striking to me and stood out to me. They have to do with what ongoing events concerning the rise of Christian nationalism that is Antichrist and what we Christians have to do in order to contend with the depravity of Christian nationalism and what it does and what to do when it comes to combating the evils of the world. So in conclusion, help those in your community, make peace by peaceful means, but for common sense gun laws and laws help create betterment for your communities, that safeguard life. Counter hatred by peaceful means, conversion, conversation, prayer, prayer is left for the between Jesus and God, Pray that hearts are no longer hardened, that hatred is eradicated, removed from those consumed by hatred and those dominated by the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate. And legal accountability. Confront anger and wrong by peaceful means. Prayer and legal accountability. God will make changes. God will answer in accordance with your heart. But we are not just listeners of the word. We have to be doers. So make peace by peaceful means. And do not let hatred bear us in your heart. As a reminder, we're confronting the evils of this world, especially hatred, as your word says, not by might, not by power, but by my presence, says the Lord. When you make your choices in this life, whatever you decide to do, always ask, is this of love? If it isn't, isn't of God, for God is love, and whoever, and whatever you do, do so out of love, and go out and love others, both those around you, your neighbors, and those who wish you to arm your enemies, and make this world better. Be the example of love, kindness, and compassion you want to see in this world. We are commanded to do this. So be so as a Christian, do this. Only through peace, peaceful interaction, peaceful conversation, prayer and legal accountability, and love can we restore those who are fallen. So help others, especially those who are so hateful, because again, as Cedric Bonhoeffer says, Christian love draws no distinction between one enemy and another, except the one more bitter our enemy's hatred, the greater is the need of love. Be his enemy political or religious, he has nothing to expect from a follower of Jesus but unqualified love. In such love, there is no inner discord between private person and official capacity. And both of you are disciples of Christ, you are not Christians at all. Please pray for the families of the victims of all these mass recent shootings and all these copycat incidents that are happening as well. Help make this world better by voting for common sense gun laws, voting for laws that sustain life and advocate for change and make your communities better by helping those in need. Do not turn a blind eye away from suffering of others. Just thoughts and prayers aren't enough concerning contending with our fallen world slash domain of the ruler of the world. So have God utilize you to make the world better by peaceful means. Everything you decide to do Make it out of love. The war of Ukraine is still ongoing and atrocities are still being committed daily there. If feeling called upon, please donate to verify all charities, humanitarian organizations that are assisting Ukraine. We can't be apathetic to hatred, let alone be apathetic to evil. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Do not speak as speak, do not act as act. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anyways, everyone, stay safe and God bless.